Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Charles County Board of Education board meeting for September 14th. My name is Tina Wilson, chairman of the board. I will now call this meeting to order. Would you please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Superintendent Navarro. Testing. Is the mic? Can you guys hear the mic? No. No. Yeah. Okay. Cafeteria voice. I, I may have to use my cafeteria voice. <laughs> <clears throat> Kyle, I hope you can get the uh, my voice. So, good afternoon, Chairperson Wilson, Vice Chairperson Ms. McGraw, and board members and staff. My report today includes a lot of information about several important updates that I would like to share with you and the community at large. But first, I would like to take a moment um, to thank teachers and staff as we have welcomed this, the third week of nearly 27,000 students. Actually, as of this morning, 27,004 students are back in our schools and learning in person with their teachers. Many of you um, have visited schools since August 30th, and the energy and the excitement is a testament that kids are happy to be back. Staff has shared messages with me about the excitement to be around students, and I appreciate the hard work and dedication of all Charles County Public School staff in making the opening of schools a success for our children. But keeping students safe for in-person learning has also meant making some tough decisions. Later today, you will hear a bit more on the adjustments to traditional school events that we've had to modify, both how they take place and how, or if we have needed to postpone them until we are certain we can have them safely um, for both our students and staff. Make no mistake, the amount of additional work hours staff is doing to keep in-person learning during this pandemic is quite significant. Additional hours taken on for testing, contact tracing, and supporting students in quarantine has translated to very long days for staff, for all staff, but in particular to administrators and nurses. And I just wanna take a moment to thank them for their leadership and their diligence as we have opened schools and welcomed 27,004 students back. We will continue to closely monitor the health conditions locally and work with our health officers to implement measures that continue to keep students safe for in-person learning. As such, I want to share that Charles County Public Schools is still offering a preventive screening program for staff and students. The program is currently utilized by high school student athletes, but available for any interested staff, member, or student. Please consider using this as a preventive and proactive resource to support the safety and well-being of all of our students. Information on how to register is on our website if you go into the COVID-19 resource pages for details. I continue to urge parents to keep sick children home and seek medical care rather than sending the, their child to school. The preventive screening program is one way families can access, test, can access testing to ensure their children are healthy and COVID free. Again, please go to our website for details. Nearly 24,000 of our students utilize Charles County bus services. The transportation department continues to support bus access for all students, but also manage an overwhelmingly large number of late student enrollments and bus driver shortages. While most bus routes are now consistent, we are still navigating some additional adjustments to bus routes that may translate in some adjustments to arrival and, um, to arrival and dismissal time. Please, um, I wanna thank the families for your continued support and for submitting tickets on time so that we can address your concerns. 
as I previously noted, we have a larger than usual number of students registering right now. We're also expanding our pre-K program seats. Our schools continue to monitor um, daily enrollments and process registrations as they are received. We are, uh, we've surpassed our student budget, uh, our budgeted student enrollment, which is just above 27,000, and we'll be working with schools to adjust schedules based on final enrollment counts at the end of the month. The virtual learning programs offered by Charles County Public Schools are underway for enrolled students. You'll hear more details later today, but note that as of yesterday, there were 286 students in the kindergarten through eighth grade virtual learning program. Live classes with our students began last week and proximity teachers start instruction on Monday, September 20th. Staff is still continuing to go through the wait list to fill all the spaces available in our K-8 program. As you're aware, the high school virtual academy application was recently reopened for new students Staff received 280 new applicants, and about 150 newly accepted students began cla begin classes next Monday with our teachers um, from the Steedome Educational Center. Over the next few weeks, students will, co will continue to undergo diagnostic testing through a new program called iReady. The program features adaptive reading and math assessments that build on students' responses. The data will provide teachers with information about areas of student mastery and areas of growth and improvement. We need to see where students are in their learning and implement instruction to target their specific needs. While I'm, while I'm on the topic of assessments, this week we are launching the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, also known as MCAP in schools. The state assessments include English, language arts, mathematics, and science. Data from the MCAP assessments will help us examine student needs and areas for growth, but also address disrupted education and help us accelerate opportunities for all students. MCAP assessments this fall will be administered to students starting in the third grade, but will test the grade or course they were enrolled in this past year, this past spring. MCAP spring testing was postponed by the Maryland State Department of Education due to COVID-19, and so we are technically taking the spring assessment now in the fall for students. I wanna end my report today on a positive note. The application process for our Teacher of the Year and Principal of the Year Awards program is now open. To the teachers and staff following along with me today, please consider nominating an outstanding teacher or leader from your school. Nominations are due by November 12th to staff in the Office of Human Resources, and details are posted in our school system's website. Thank you so much, and I wanna um, continue to thank the board for their continued support as we navigate um, a very different uh, beginning to the school year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Next on our agenda is correspondence from board members, uh, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, let me just start off by saying I've, uh, I've never been so happy to be stuck behind a school bus. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was great to have kids um, back in school. And, and although I think we can all agree it's not at the ideal conditions, but we're, we're doing everything we can um, given what we're having to deal with. Um, I've had an opportunity to go to a lot of sporting events and um, it's great to see kids active in that and uh, a lot of good turnouts from, from parents too. Uh, I'll say I've, I've gone to a lot of these over the years and I, I've, I've noticed an uptick in, in the participation of parents and that's really good. And to our staff, um, I, I commented last night to um, a, a staff someone on administration in one of the high schools, I said, just a typical 14 hour day for you. It was 8.30 and I know she'd been there since at least seven o'clock and um, our staff just do a, a tremendous job in, um, in, in making our schools work. And, and I think we all should be proud of that. Um, I also had the opportunity to attend a town hall that was, um, that Senator Van Hollen uh, put on, uh, Deputy Superintendent Lyons was there as well. And uh, I think it was, it was a great opportunity for the Senator to hear from our local officials, our, our delegates and our commissioners regarding a number of things. But uh, this was 
kind of focused on library access, but then the, the, the conversation talked about internet access and also digital literacy, which is something that I think we, um, even though we, that we provide access both in the school system and in the county level, um, making sure that people understand literally how to navigate the internet is something that, that we can all can improve on. So uh, I know that the deputy superintendent brought back some good information and I think we should just work with our, our library system and our county commissioners to make sure that, that we're serving as many people as possible as we continue to expand uh, high speed internet throughout the county. And uh, I just want to conclude, uh, if I could, just a, a point of personal privilege. Um, last, last week, the county lost a great person. Um, Joe Gressis was, was an incredible human being, and, and many of you, if you don't know him, you, you, you know about the businesses that he had. And Joe was just an extremely giving person. And so I've spoken to a couple folks, and I'm sure other people have the same thought, but um, uh, we, we will be working to establish a, a scholarship in his name for deserving students. So I just ask everyone to keep an eye out for that. And um, if you'd like to help, you, you'll, you'll see things on, on social medias or, or for word of mouth. But um, Joe did so much for this community. And um, I think it's only fitting that, that, that we honor him um, by helping some deserving students as they continue their, their careers after high school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Mr. Hurd. Uh, I just wanted to agree firstly with Mr. Lucas uh, in thanking our teachers and our staff for their work at the start of this school year. Uh, we knew it was gonna be hard and it might hit some bumps, but staff have been adaptive. And as a result of that, we're seeing the benefits of students back in the classroom and really bringing the school system back to its core values of teaching and learning. Uh, another point uh, I wanted to bring up is that I think it's important that we take action to responsibly safeguard our athletics programs uh, so that they may continue to compete both within and outside of our school district. And I think that takes all of us. It's not just the board. Uh, that includes the athletes following proper protocols, the coaches uh, ensuring that we are doing everything in a safe manner, but I think our community, as Mr. Lucas said, is sending a message that it has been sorely missed and it's greatly needed. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up was students were disappointed to see homecoming canceled and that we hope that the board and staff will work to plan a safe alternative and set that as a priority. And then finally, I just wanted to congratulate Eric Valentine, student liaison of La Plata High School uh, on being appointed as the alternate student member of the, of the board. Uh, this is Eric's second year in the boardroom advocating on behalf of students, and I know that the student voice is safe in his hands. So thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Hancock. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a few things. Um, I had the uh, pleasure on, opening, on the opening day of schools to attend both Pickle Waxen and Walter J. Mitchell. Um, I got to uh, speak a little bit with uh, Principal Thinstead, who's new to Pickle Waxen, and she did a very great job on, on the opening day of school. I arrived there shortly after the buses were there, and everything was very smooth, very smooth. Um, I also got to go to Walter J. Mitchell, and um, it's, it's a wonderful school there. Uh, I was talking to Principal Adam, and uh, they're a school with about 600 students. And because of COVID, about half of those students are being driven to school right now. And uh, it's, it's putting a strain on the staff, but the staff is doing a really good job at getting students from the, from the car line to, uh, into the building. And um, I wanna give a shout out to uh, Mr. Margolis and um, school nurse Holly Jackson. They do a really good job each and every day. And they're working very long hours, not just them, but the entire team. They've uh, been under a lot of stress, and um, I hope that people that drop their kids off, it can be long, but you need to bring your patience with you. That's one thing that we've all had to deal with throughout this whole pandemic going on two years now. You, everything is going to require a lot more patience than normal, but you can be assured that everyone is working as hard as they can to do their job. I um, also got to attend uh, the, both the first virtual and first in-person uh, middle school redistricting uh, hearing 
it was good to hear from the only person that came out to the first one at uh, La Plata High School. Um, the, the gentleman's name was Steve, and I can't remember his last name, but I, I do want to thank him for caring enough about the future of his child, his children, to come out. And um, I know his input definitely weighed on some of my personal thoughts, for sure. I um, also want to follow up with uh, my colleague, Mr. Lucas, on the passing of Joe Gressis. Uh, we, as a community, lost a tremendous leader that will never, ever be replaced. And I'm glad to hear Mr. Lucas talking about some things that will happen moving forward. Uh, Joe was a leader in the sense that he found solutions to problems. And whenever you're around him, you felt like you were part of his family. Uh, a lot of you all are probably familiar with his uh, annual Thanksgiving dinner that he would do at Glazio Restaurant, uh, free of charge to anyone that needed a place to eat and it wasn't just a cold cheese sandwich it was a it was a good hot home cooked meal that he invested a lot of time and a lot of money into and he'll never be replaced and he'll never be forgotten thank you thank you mr hancock mrs battle lockhart all right good afternoon everyone um I had the pl first of all welcome back to school. <laughs> um, it's it's been it's been a great journey to see all the little ones, the big ones, the in between ones, <laughs> walking into school excited about it. Um, I had the pleasure of um, visiting J C Parks um, on the first day of school, uh, Davis Middle School, and uh, North Point, of course. Want to make sure things are good over there. Um, and to piggyback on what David said as well is that um, we knew that uh, there was going to be car riders, but <laughs> um, those are some long lines, and they're still pretty long. Um, I'm one of those parents that drop off and pick up, so, um, but we're finding our, our way through this uh, new normal. Um, I like to um, congratulate the team at uh, North Point. Uh, they really had a smooth process going on from the bus end of things <laughs> um, as the buses come in because there were so many car riders, the buses couldn't get in. <laughs> um, but they handled it like champs. Uh, Davis Middle School, when I had a chance to go visit them, I was um, excited to see um, the principal and his team um, going over their meal plan and making sure that all the safety precautions were um, being considered and they were preparing and meeting prior to. I love to see proactiveness and um, kudos to them. And um, JC Parks, <laughs> they were, the little ones were so excited. Of course, you know, I got to share every year. They're always showing off their new shoes. <laughs> um, so I was uh, excited to be there, but it was hard to get there um, because of the traffic, of course, but it looks like we made it through. We're in uh, week three. Um, as uh, David mentioned, um, I attended um, all of our redistricting middle school meetings, virtual and in person as well. I would like to again thank those um, volunteers that supported and put in the plans, the options together. And um, the last meeting, we had a pretty great attendance considering <laughs> the first meeting we didn't have as much attendance. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what did I want to say? And we attended the Leadership Institute and really enjoyed the keynote speaker that they had. And um, of course, the board retreat that we had. So I'm um, looking forward to um, us coming on the other side, finding our way to getting truly back into the learning um, for the kids and trying to find our sense of normalcy again. Um, but thank you every last one of you guys for your efforts. It has not been easy. <laughs> um, I've had a chance to um, drive by, um, talk to some principals, some um, staff members, and I hear in your voice that it's a lot. However, you show up every day. Those that continue to show up, we appreciate you showing up. And um, we're here to support you as much as we can uh, within our you know, limits of social distancing and things like that. But um, I commend you for still 
uh, standing through this uh, tough time right now. So thank you for the opportunity and we look forward to having a great year. Thank you, Mrs. Battle Lockhart. This is Ms. Brown. I'm glad to see the kids back in school also. I did have an opportunity to attend the Leadership Institute and I could not resist staying to hear Rochelle Eisenberg because she is so entertaining. You don't go to sleep on her. I did, <laughs> uh, um, I did attend all three redistricting uh, hearings and town halls, and I was disappointed that more parents were not involved in it, considering it's affecting all middle schools. The last one we did have more because it was virtual, but some of the others were virtual too, and it wasn't as many there. So I just hope that parents start to read and make sure they're reading their emails so that they can become more involved in what's going on and know what's going on. Social media is good, but you don't get all the correct facts through social media. Um, the first day of school, I attended Westlake, Matterwoman, Barry, and Summers. I was really impressed with Mr. D'Ambrosier at Barry because he was going around making sure he was modeling the proper way to wear a mask for the little people. But I was really impressed that those little kids were just as happy with those masks and just going right on, and they were all wearing them properly, too. So a lot of people think little kids can't wear a mask, but those kids, it didn't seem to stop them not one bit. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Ms. McGraw? Sure. Well, I want to add my congratulations and thanks to Dr. Navarro and her staff, to every principal and teacher and every other staff member in our county that contributed to the smooth opening of schools. And I do say smooth because there were a few bumps along the way, and I do have to give a huge shout out to transportation. Because when I heard that there were 2,000 registrations the week before school started, <laughs> that certainly did put a kink in your well-oiled machine. So thank you all very much for the work that you have done to have this transition year be a smooth one for everybody. And I would just like to say, oh, well, I also visited some schools on the second day of school. I wanted to thank Ms. Perillo, uh, Ms. Blanford over at Indian Head, Mr. Miller, and um, Ms. Caballero. And I, at, at uh, Hanson, I went um, on the second day and I wanted to especially see the lunch and how, how lunch was being handled. And I have to say that each one of those principals, once again, had a <clears throat> routine that was already in place that the children on the second day of school were very uh, adapted to, had, had adapted to it very well. From the little markers on the tables as to how they should you know, di uh, distance themselves to the way that they got in line. So thank you all very much for all the hard work that goes into uh, an opening of school. And lastly, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank the many, many organizations, church groups, individuals, and businesses that provided backpacks and supplies um, this, this year for many of our underserved population. Um, I have to say, um, everybody, there were so many. It was, it was nice to read in the paper or just to hear about on social media how many different organizations were available. So it's much appreciated. And I have to say our community is very, very generous to this, our public school system. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mrs. McGraw. Um, I would like to have a shout out to um, six librarians uh, that are recognized as School Librarians of the Year from the Maryland Association of School Librarians. When you make the recommendation that we need to celebrate Librarian Week. All of a sudden, librarians in the in the in the school system become your best friends, and I'm <laughs> and I certainly love uh, certainly love our librarians. A lot of times they don't get recognized, but I would like to say, on record, congratulations to Tim Stillman from Theodore Davis Middle School, Lisa Samorado from Pekawaxen, Margaret Donahue from Lackey High School. Karen Russo from Arthur Middleton, Dawn Murphy Marshall from J.C. Parks, and Heather Hartman Jansen from Milton Summers. Um, congratulations on, on that honor. And um, it, they are one of many hardworking uh, con contributors to our school system. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to, to our, our very own 
Mr. Ian Hurd and the La Plata High School marching <laughs> band. If, if you are, are a Beatles fan, you will, will, would have been impressed if you were at the uh, last Friday night's game uh, at La Plata High, so job well done. I know you guys have been practicing in the heat and the presentation, of course, was awesome. Um, and I wanna thank the booster clubs out there that do so much work for these athletic events. Um, your contributions do not go unnoticed. And, the, and I know the lines are long and a lot of people want their hot dogs and sodas so they can get back to actions. But I wanna ask the public to continue to support these bo booster clubs. Um, for the record, um, I attended uh, MABE training for Opens Meeting Act, and one of the recommendations as a result of completing this training is that um, if you do attend this training, they, they ask that it is announced to the public who, who is certified for the Opens Meetings Act. I know that there are others that have attended um, but um, as a point of record, they um, strongly want the boards to announce to the public who has been designated or who has attended the most recent training. And with that said, I want to look over to my right. I know that we have our student liaisons. I know that we could not accommodate all, all of you guys but we try to get as many of you in here and we, I'm welcoming you again. Is there anybody that has not been introduced? I see, I see La Plata High's represented, Mr. Yeah. Valentine, uh, the young lady behind you, sir. Have you been introduced? Uh, which high school are you from? St. Charles. Charles and you, ma'am. From Westlake, okay. I wanna make sure you guys have a voice. Do you have any announcements that you'd like to share uh, to, to the public? You can come see the marching band again this Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and what time? 7 At 7 fifth, but barring any sports injuries, right? <laughs> okay, all right. All right, any other correspondence? Okay, thank you again. So next on our agenda is Mr. Sean Heil. President of the Education of Association of Charles County. Welcome back. This feels good to say that. Good afternoon, Board of Education members and Dr. Navarro. As we continue through these new and challenging days, EACC stands ready to work with CCPS leadership to ensure that education, educators receive the supports they need to be successful and to create rich and meaningful learning experiences for our students. Although there continues to be hurdles we need to conquer collectively health and safety concerns to be a primary concern, as well as the impact of managing health and safety and workload. At the foremost of educators' minds these days are the impacts of COVID-19 and their concerns for staffing, lost instructional time, and the effect of the pandemic on their own ability to provide for the needs of their families. EACC conducted a member poll, and I'm here to be a voice of the employees today and present those results. The majority of membership responded that they appreciate the decision the Board of Education made to reinstate the mask mandate. Of those who responded, 88.89% supports this decision as one strategy in our plan to maintain healthy and safe work environments. With respect to the possibility of a vac vaccination requirement, although large numbers of staff support vac vaccination at 65.40%, there are various concerns that were raised by the remaining 34.6% of respondents who have reasons that include medical conditions that preclude vaccination, religious objections, and the complicated na nature of mandating anything and how that could impact their own personal decision making. EACC understands that it is within the right of CCPS leadership to decide about vaccinations, and we are requesting that if a change is necessary, that EACC be involved in its, con if it, con bleh, excuse me, constitutes a change in working, can address the, the change that would be, be impacting the workload. Educators are staying tuned into the ever involving COVID standard operating procedure. Of those surveyed, 81% had read the SOP that was updated on August. 
Each day, EHCC receives many questions about the health and safety plan and nuances of experience that require resolutions. Most recently, we're hearing about the very real challenges of field trips and the numerous disruptions that are a result of trying to monitor student health and implement the protocols to prevent the spread of the virus within buildings. The largest concern for our members, nearly one in three who chose to leave a question, asked in some form, why do they have to take their own leave when they're being mandated to take off due to COVID? <laughs> CCPS has the means to work with both EACC and ASME to come up with solutions to address employee concerns about leave and the very real possibility of loss of pay if leave is exhausted due to multiple quarantines. The last thing employees should be worried about at this juncture is they could, could be without leave if they are sick. EACC believes that this is the time to engage employee groups and work together to find solutions for the concern of the overflowing places of all employment. Recently, a member leader of EACC expressed concerns about the sustainability of what we are currently doing to assist as a system. This is a belief that we haven't found the right balance to manage quarantining staff, students, and the myriad tasks that go along with implementing health and safety measures. I've been asked several times by Unit 1 and Unit 2 about how long the current system is sustainable in the individual classroom or the individual school. This leads to questions about how long our school system can sustain what's being placed on it due to COVID protocols. The right balance can only be found by engaging education from both educators from both Unit 1 and Unit 2 who are in the trenches every day. EACC stands ready to engage in conversations about working conditions, reasonable workloads, and the impact of potential lost wages. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Heil. Mrs. Birch. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Birch. I am president of ASME Local 2981. The starting of school has been great for ASME. A meeting was set up for my first introduction with Dr. Navarro. We talked for an hour. Already we have plans to move forward with some of ASME's old ideas and create new ones. The MAG survey will be covered at the board meeting today. Helping instructional assistance is always on AFSME's radar. It was a great meeting, and each month we will hold a meeting to move forward. As the executive board knows, one of my target areas is membership. Since August 25th, ASME has recruited 40 new members for a total of 337 members. The college program that ASME offers is one of the main reasons for such a wonderful increase. I have personally spoken to two groups of support personnel. Other members of the ASME executive board have been available for new employees. Each month on the first Tuesday, a meeting is held for members only. September 7th, a Zoom meeting was held. 22 members attended. As everyone has heard, there is a sh shortage of support personnel, not only in Charles County, but all over the United States. Charles County offers a bonus for referring new employees of $1,000. The information is on the CCBOE website. The form should be filled in at the time the new employee is applying with the information of the employee that recommended he or she. Remember, be safe, vaccinate. up to the podium. Dr. Navarro, I'm just say, uh, just speaking publicly, there's been some issues, technical issues with the YouTube, and I know um, Paul behind the scenes can, can hear me say, say that. 
So uh, there's been some technical reporting. Um, it apparently is is up now, but it has had some some issues. Good afternoon. And welcome to our opening of schools presentation. Woohoo! So, <laughs> so with uh, all that we've heard so far this afternoon, um, lots of our thunder's already been stolen, but we will <laughs> certainly uh, share the information that we have presented, uh, prepared for you here today. And so uh, joining me before we get started, we have with us today Jason Stoddard, Director of School Safety and Security. Sabrina Robinson Taylor, Principal of Billingsley Elementary School. Kathy Perello, Principal at Henry E. Lackey High School. And Linda Gill, Executive Director of Schools. Thank you very much. And so uh, as we open this school year in probably the most uh, unique and different way uh, than we've ever done before, uh, there certainly has been no shortage of excitement in the air with regard to welcoming our students back. And so you'll see just a few uh, snapshots of just a very few of the 27 plus thousand students who we invited back, welcomed back with open arms uh, this school year, smiling faces, albeit behind masks. Um, certainly, uh, these are the real reason why we are here and why we do what we do. And so the numbers there, you can see our total enrollment. Um, as of last Wednesday, this was the count that we had, but I but, but we may have some of our pre-K students included in that number because that number is a little bit different than what you heard from Dr. Navarro earlier today. And so, so right around 27,000. And as you can see, our elementary school uh, students um, obviously will, will have the largest numbers, um, uh, 11,600. Middle schools at 62, 79 there, and the high schools totaling nine, uh, 9,046. And we are certainly building towards our September count as we know that there are some students who uh, have not uh, returned to us just yet, but they are planning to, at least as far as what we have heard. And so we are looking forward to welcoming even more students coming in the very near future. So you may have heard that we have opened a virtual school for students in grades kindergarten through eighth grade. And so um, beginning in August, we opened up an application process. Students who um, were enrolled in our school system who demonstrated success with virtual instruction last year were eligible for virtual instruction this year. So by, uh, to operationalize that, we said success meant that they missed fewer than 15 days of school last year, that they had no Ds or Fs in fourth quarter, and that they had somebody at home that could make sure that they would get up and get on the computer, an, an adult at home. So we received 2,584 applications as of September 8th for that K through 8 school, and then our application window did close. Out of those applications, 1,742 children were eligible. That means that some, some parents applied or applied on behalf of their children, even though they knew that there were Ds or Fs or that they didn't meet the attendance uh, uh, guideline. So there were 450 seats available. That number is probably familiar to you. You've, you've heard that. And we have offered, as of last Wednesday, 797 seats. Because what happened is as we offered children a seat in the virtual school, some parents declined it. And so then we would re-offer the seat and then parents might accept or decline. And then we would re-offer the seat. We're trying to fill all 450 seats. So as of last Wednesday, 365 uh, children had their parents decline their seat that they had originally applied. They were accepted into the virtual school and 365 children had their parents decline their seat and said, no, thank you. I'm not interested in virtual school which is why we've offered so many seats, because some seats were offered over and over and over again until we could fill somebody in the seat. Um, as of this week, we were still offering those seats. We're still trying to be sure that we can fill all of those seats. As of September 8th, which was last week, 247 children were enrolled in the virtual school, which had a 450 uh, student capacity. And so we're still working through that. Um, some parents 
didn't get back to us. There's probably why there's a difference between the actual and the enrollment um, and the opportunity. Because some parents, we were just calling and trying to get a hold of somebody, and they were um, letting us know whether they were accepting or not. We're trying to fill all of those 450 seats that we opened up for virtual school for K through eight. And so that was a virtual K to eight. And so we'll talk a little bit about our virtual school nine through 12, virtual school expansion, we uh, were calling it initially. And so these are our high school students, obviously. And so we have uh, 350 seats available uh, to these students at this point. And we are currently, we have currently have uh, 309 of those uh, seats filled. And so this program, you will recall back in the spring, we opened it up and we accepted 175 students uh, back then. And so we did have an opportunity just a few weeks ago to reopen and offer uh, more seats to uh, some high school students per the demand that we were receiving. And so we've done that. Uh, we have uh, enrolled more, uh, uh, lots more, and we certainly do anticipate um, filling all of those seats. And so again, this opened just a couple weeks ago, and so we um, uh, have a little bit of time left to fill the rest of those seats. Um, but beyond the instruction, uh, certainly there's lots of support being provided to the school from our school counselors, high school counselors in particular, those being the folks who are responsible for uh, monitoring students' transcripts and their uh, course selections and all to ensure that they are on the right pathway for uh, graduation. And so we will uh, continue along uh, continue with these efforts and again these numbers are as of last Wednesday uh, but we will continue until we fill all 350 of those uh, spots in the virtual high school um, we have talked about transportation and oh wait a minute oh okay so there have been lots of bus driver changes and there are some vacancies you've heard the word uh, shortage that we're still looking for drivers and that, combined with the 2,000 new students that enrolled uh, just before school started, has caused lots of routing adjustments. And I, transportation is working very hard to make those adjustments to get everybody that's eligible for bus transportation on a bus route and be sure that a bus is there. And we're just working through um, some of that. We have 1,363 bus routes. And just to remind our community, there is the school locator. You can find what your bus transportation is. And those who don't have transportation or should look at that school locator because they are making changes. I know that transportation was working this weekend and still making changes to be sure that uh, the routes were as efficient as possible. At the beginning of this school year, just like every school year, we set up a bus hotline where we have live support on the days before school starts and the days right after school starts. And we handled, answered uh, 4,707 calls. It's a lot of phone calls. And then, of course, parents have the opportunity to put in help desk tickets and ask for um, a, different so a different stop or a bus change or they um, have concerns about something. And so transportation is working through those help desk tickets. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I was asked to come in and to describe some of the discussions that we've, that, that I'm sure you guys have heard about exposure, and we just heard uh, uh, Mr. Howell talk about um, the use of uh, quarantine and things such as that. So we wanted to make sure that this was abundantly clear to not only to the board but also to our community. So if we have an exposure, and please understand that when we deal with exposures, we are dealing with K, we're dealing with K to 12 indoors student to student that is one category where masks are worn according to the latest guidance from the cdc any student that is within three feet of a known positive person uh, would be considered to be exposed that is the latest cdc guidance so remember we're talking about a few different buckets here so student to student k in a k to 12 indoor classroom with masks worn the students can be three feet or um, must be or, or the guidance is anyone under three feet would be considered exposed if we have a known covid positive person for adults and, in, and other and other individuals or outside of the k-12 to indoor classroom the social distancing guidelines are still remain six feet and anybody who meets the 15 minute contact or the 15 minute exposure within a 24 hour period would be considered exposed to a known COVID positive person. So when we do that contact tracing, when, when these uh, two marvelous principals along with the other 37 that we have um, are informed of 
a COVID positive student inside of their classroom, they go pull seating charts, interview teachers, look at bus, look at um, bus uh, seating charts as well as who the children have recess, if they play recess, if there's athletics involved, as well as um, uh, where the kids sit at lunch, who they sit with, things like that. As we have said since the beginning of this, our aim was three feet in the classroom. We understood right from the beginning of this with 27,000 students returning, especially in some of our smaller schools, that three feet was not going to be possible. We demanded three feet at lunch because they were going to be without their masks for a, shorter period of, for a short period of time while they ate. So that defines exposure. So when we have an individual who is exposed, if there are over 12, the first question that is asked, and this includes our staff, the first question that is asked is, are you vaccinated? Since April, the CDC guidance has said that if you were fully vaccinated, which is the final shot in the dose series that you get, plus two weeks, you no longer had to quarantine. That has been the rule from the CDC since April. We have followed that rule since April. It is nothing new. So as it sits here today, um, if an individual does not want to miss school and they are eligible for a shot, does not want to use their leave and is eligible for a shot, we would strongly recommend that they have that conversation with their doctor about whether getting the COVID-19 vaccination is appropriate for them. If they are fully vaccinated, final dose plus two weeks, they, know they do not have to quarantine if they have been exposed. So if they met either one of those exposure thresholds, whether they're a child or a staff member, they would not have to quarantine. What we would ask them to do is self-monitor for seven days from the date of the last exposure, make sure that they're minding their mask and continue to keep their social distance um, during that, that self-monitoring period, and then consider testing three to five days after the exposure. That's one bucket. We go to the second bucket, which is unvaccinated individuals, either by choice or by age. So an individual who is unvaccinated, who is exposed, whether it's a student or a staff member, would be required at minimum to quarantine for a period of no less than seven days. That is seven calendar days from the date of the exposure, not seven days from the date of the notification. And we must keep in mind the incubation period of COVID, how long it takes people to get testing now and how long those notifications take. Sometimes we're finding out on day six that someone was exposed seven days pre or six days previous. So their quarantine would, would likely only be a single day. So they must quarantine for a period of seven days. They may return on day seven with a negative test. Now, as you've seen, we updated our SOP process or our, our, our testing in our SOPs because it became non-sustainable. And that should tell everyone that we are watching and what's going on. Um, testing in the community is growing. It has been difficult for some people to get testing. Rapid testing is becoming less and less available. Um, there are a number of different reasons for that um, because rapid testing, while it gives us a good result, <laughs> It takes a tremendous amount of time to go through the paperwork and it takes us a tremendous amount of time to enter that information into what is called crisp so when you when we talk about our nurses specifically doing rapid testing it is probably about it while the rapid test itself takes 15 minutes and it doesn't take long to swab somebody's nose it's a 30 to 45 minute process for every test that is taken so we've had we've been forced to change some of that so we have asked our community to go into the community into the general public to receive that testing if they wish to return their child back at day seven, they must have a test that's dated either day seven, day eight, or day nine, because we know the incubation period for COVID is five to seven days. So when somebody is exposed, they will not get sick for five to seven days after the exposure. We currently have a tremendous amount of discussion with inside of our community that says, my, daughter, my son or daughter was exposed on Saturday, they're not sick, I'm sending them to school. That the fact that it takes five days for this to incubate and we're not going to know that you have COVID until you start to show signs and symptoms or you test positive and you're considered contagious two days prior to symptom onset is the reason that the quarantine is so important. So that's why we put people out for a minimum of seven days because that is the top end that it usually takes that it takes COVID to begin to develop signs and symptoms. If the parents do not wish or the staff member does not wish to be tested, they can quarantine for a period of 10 days these are both, all three of these are CDC guidance. You can quarantine for a period of 10 days and return without a test. Now, in either case, if symptoms develop, we ask that they test immediately. If they do test negative, we can ask them to continue, and, and depend, if, they're, if they're vaccinated, they continue to stealth monitor because we do not want sick people inside of our schools. We don't want sick staff members feeling as though they're forced to come to school. Um, if, but if they're sick, they need to stay home. Currently, there's about four different things that are floating around in the world, or three other things that are floating around the world outside of COVID that all have very similar signs and symptoms, such as the flu, RSV, the natural cold, and things like that. All right, the other one is, is if they test positive, they must isolate for a period of 10 days. 
Now, when we talk about quarantines and isolations, we are providing that guidance along with the health department. We cannot follow up. We are, rec we are asking the parents and the students to follow what we're telling them to do, even if they disagree with it, because these are the processes. They have been the processes for quite some time. In a vast majority of our cases, our families are paying attention. They're doing the right thing, and that's what we want. However, we have had some bumps in the road. We have had to have some discussions. We've had some students that have returned early. We've had some students who, some, some families who have decided that they were, just weren't going to listen and attempt to send, send their kids into school the next day. So we are fighting, uh, we, are, we, we have a great deal of parents that are, and, fam and community members that are doing amazing things for us that are helping us. But we need everybody's help when it comes to this. So considering all that Mr. Stoddard just shared, and I know you might need a moment to digest all of that, we are, or in our efforts to prioritize in-person learning um, for as much and as long as we uh, possibly can safely, we have had to, to plan some things a little bit differently. And so these are uh, a few of the efforts that we'll share that, that comprise of things that we are talking about doing a little bit differently. The continuity of learning plans, uh, you've heard a lot about those uh, where we've asked the principals to work with their school staffs uh, to ensure that there is work on, on their school websites uh, available to students who are qu under quarantine or um, being isolated and uh, to work with the live support that uh, the schools have made available for those students as well uh, when they're out on quarantine. Uh, the open house events that we typically have, we've asked our schools to go to a virtual format for these. Um, these are the events that typically draw out hundreds of people. As everyone knows, people are excited about uh, getting, getting back to school. And so uh, that was a bit of a concern at this point. And so we, we did ask our schools to return to a virtual format for open house. Uh, we've scaled down some other events. Um, particularly those that would draw out larger crowds. Uh, the PTO events, um, sometimes those will draw out large um, crowds of people, uh, but the ever popular homecoming dance and the uh, school dances, we have said that uh, these are things that need to be scaled down a little bit. Um, well, uh, scaled down or pushed back or postponed and even canceled in some respects until we get to a point where we can uh, reconsider those things. Um, at this point, it's just not the safest thing to do, in our view, to hold the, the homecoming dances and whatnot. Uh, we also have given some guidance regarding field trips. Um, our SOP currently asks parents to pick up children who are, 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 are symptomatic within an hour's time. And so to be consistent with our uh, standard operating procedures, we have um, uh, given the guidance uh, regarding our field trips that they uh, be no further than an hour's distance, so basically remaining in the, in the region, so that if there was a student who became symptomatic out on a field trip, they still could have that opportunity to be picked up within an hour. Uh, that would be the expectation, and so uh, that was the, the rationale for giving that, that guidance on regarding field trips. And then contact tracing, quarantine, and isolation. Uh, our principals could probably tell you way more than what they would want to about all that that entails at this time. Um, pe people are, are really working uh, hard at, at staying on top of that. And then COVID-19 testing, you heard a little bit about this uh, earlier where uh, we do offer testing in our schools to our uh, high school students in particular. Uh, the athletes are the one group, our student athletes is the one group that is required to, uh, to undergo weekly testing if they have not been vaccinated. Uh, but the testing is, as um, I think maybe Dr. Navarro mentioned, um, is available to uh, students who would like to register and adults, uh, staff, um, who would like to register uh, to be uh, tested through this company that we have uh, contracted in our schools. So these are some decisions that we've made in order to prioritize the in-person in instruction and learning. Um, so here to talk today about how schools are managing uh, to keep as safe as possible are two of our principals. So Ms. Perillo from Henry E. Lackey High School is gonna talk a little bit about some of the precautions that they're taking at her school. Good afternoon. We begin each day with a friendly reminder through morning announcements. The students are at that age where, where they understand the announcements very well and they take to heart the importance of it. 
So we begin our morning announcements at 8:10 after first period each day, and it's always we end with, all right, Lackey Chargers, let's make it a great day and live by the Charger way by always wearing our mask and make sure that it covers your mouth and your noses and frequently washing your hands and using hand sanitizer. And I always kind of add in there, not just now during a pandemic, but that's something we should do all the time <laughs> and socially distancing ourselves from others. So we give them that friendly reminder. Of course, as they exit the school buses or they come in off of their uh, car riding situations or if they're, they're drivers, we are able, we have staff out front as well to monitor and make sure no one enters the building without a mask. Our students, I'm pleased to report, are excelling with wearing their mask. That is an area that uh, they know the importance. It's a testament to that because the first week of school, two students had the strap on one of the disposable mask break and the students held the mask to their face and sought out an administrator to get a replacement. So I think that that was a testament in itself that they, they understand the importance of that. Um, students are wearing their mask in classes all the time while they're in the schools. But the one time that they're permitted to take off their mask um, in the high school setting would be during lunch uh, when they are actively eating and or drinking. And with that, like my fellow high school colleagues, most schools have instituted a QR code system. So if you look at that picture there that's provided in that um, slide there, you're going to see that that's a QR code on each table. Each table has been assigned a number. So students, when they enter the cafeteria, they use their phone, or if, if the student does not have a, a phone, then of course all students have laptops that have been issued by CCPS. So the students can sign in using the, the link through the Microsoft form as well. And uh, once they sign in, that's how we know which students are at that table and we also manage the number of students at the table as Mr. Stoddart mentioned earlier. In the cafeteria, of course, we can accommodate more than we can perhaps in the lobby where the seating is much more limited. We opened up the school on a four lunch shift schedule and that was done by grade level. So the lunches were much smaller. That way students could get used to entering the cafeteria, you know, using their device to scan with the QR code so we would know where they are, where they're seated. It helps us with contact tracing. And then we did that for six days. And then after that, we moved to a three lunch period, which is where we, re we remain. That is a phase, what we call a phase two lunch. And now students are, we go, will go to lunch according to where their classroom, their, particularly their sixth period class is located. What we have found is that students would sign in like we've asked them to do, and then they would get in line to go to lunch. But then another student might wanna come and sit at that particular table. So we had to um, modify and we had to reevaluate and adjust. So what we did with that is all students now on the three lunch shifts, they come in, everyone has to be seated first. They take their device, sign in on their QR code or use their laptop, and then we dismiss the students to get in line for lunch because we have to limit the number of students that can be in a, a lunch line at a time. We're gonna remain here momentarily because we wanna make sure that we wanna get we're not gonna get at 100% sign in because we have a number of students who leave early for a principal's waiver or a college waiver, or we have our fire and rescue students, and of course we have our CTE students who eat alternating lunches as well. But we wanna get as close to, um, there's no such thing as perfection, but in this case, as perfection as we can with signing in for contact tracing purposes. Once students, we have a, a good percentage um, you know, higher than 90% that we can regulate with them signing in, then we will move into what we call phase three of the lunch shifts, which will consist of the hour long lunch, which will be divided into two lunch shifts. And students will use the same QR code as we we're doing right now in the cafeteria, but then the QR code would also be in the teacher's classroom. It would extend to the to classrooms where students would be able to attend extracurricular activities, receive additional academic support and interventions. 
Also with us is Principal Sabrina Robinson Taylor from Billingsley Elementary School to give us the perspective from the elementary school principalship. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have certainly had to make some adjustments to day-to-day -day operations on the elementary level as well. Uh, one of the first things we did was to use multiple doors as entrances and exits so that there's never a line to access the building. Um, rather than mass exit off of school buses, in the mornings we have a buses lined the curb and only uh, release two or three buses at a time to limit uh, the, the foot traffic, the flow of students, and limit large amounts of students moving all at once. All of our students must enter the school building wearing a mask. For those that don't have a mask, our first question is always, is there an extra one in your book bag? Because most of the time there is. Um, we've asked parents to make sure that they pack several um, as you know, straps break, as masks get wet. And so um, lots of times students do have one and we do have those extras in the office for those that don't have an extra in their book bag. Um, and then we offer multiple areas for children to pick up their breakfast so that we don't have lines once again. Within classrooms, our desks are arranged in groups of two instead of your traditional clusters of four in which they're facing one another. And so with a cluster of two desks, it allows for the students to sit three feet apart when you're counting student to student. And um, so that's worked well for us. Um, students do enjoy having a desk partner and all the students face the same direction. Our building service team has supplied classrooms, of course, with sanitizer as well as disinfectant. And um, many teachers are diligently using those items as well as um, the regular cleaning, routine cleaning that occurs daily. Um, many of the teachers are beginning to teach lessons outdoors. And um, for instance, I tweeted recently that our science teacher held a lesson outside on our rooftop classroom. And so that is going to become contagious and more teachers are gonna take advantage of that as well, as well as PE is occurring outdoors as well. So, um, and then within other areas of the building, teachers have taught students to walk in lines with a three foot gap. And so students, had to get a visual of what three feet looks like. And some of them will, on their own, actually walk like this, such that they're sure that no one is too close to them this way or too close to them from behind. Um, every student was, has been asked to bring a water bottle, since we cannot use the water fountains. And for students that, do, that don't, doesn't or forgets or doesn't have a water bottle, we do provide cups for them. And uh, we also had a very generous parent donation of 11 cases of water. And so we will use that to provide for students that don't have a water bottle as well. In addition, uh, for lunch, some students eat in the classrooms while others eat in the cafeteria as we try to spread students out. Our building service workers work to clean and sanitize the desks in the classroom once they've eaten in the classroom and um, grade levels have begun to try to add additional students. And in the cafeteria is where students really want to be. That's what they're used to with coming to school. And so we try to get as many in as we possibly can while still keeping the three feet of distance. Um, and then our students actually sit, because elementary children can get squirrely, so we actually have the round stickers that says sit here. <laughs> so that they try to stay in position instead of sliding. With regard to our school office, uh, we meet the needs of parents and visitors as much as we can outside, outdoors. So if parents coming to pick something up, we meet them at the door with the item. Um, we do um, frequent sanitizing, of course, of the scholarship machine used to sign in, as well as all surfaces. And then our parents have been amazing. Um, they've been very diligent with calling us to let us know that children are sick or ill, notifying us of when uh, someone in the family has been diagnosed COVID positive, and so, and all are arriving within the hour to pick up sick children. Next steps for us personally are to, um, to revise our plan for bathrooms with a visual so that students know how many children are in the uh, multi-user bathrooms and when they have to wait 
for an available bathroom. Um, I wanted to highlight the last bullet there are student services. Our student services team has been amazing with helping us at Billingsley. On the first day of school, our PPW, who is Donna Robinson, um, manned for me a parent resource table, which allowed for all parents to get their questions answered, their needs met on the outside instead of crowding the, the, the main office. And so um, that was a huge support. Parents were given a form to complete with their concern or their question and to indicate if they wanted to call back later that day or if they were waiting in their vehicle and which we prioritized and, and took care of their needs as well. Our PPWs and our counselors will begin working with families uh, with children in quarantine to make sure that the work is provided, that their work is picked up, and that the emotional needs of the students are met as well. Um, our continuity of learning team is getting instruction of materials as well as Zoom lesson links to our families. And um, young children thrive on rules and procedure. <laughs> and so we are masking, we are sanitizing, we're keeping our distance in every way possible. So our principals have been very purposeful um, in helping our staff uh, just think through how we can make school happen in the safest way possible. And so what else is exciting and new are, are a couple of our uh, construction projects, and I think you'll hear a little bit more about that from, from Mr. Hyman a little bit, a little bit later on, but uh, Benjamin Stoddard Middle School, to name one of them, a beautiful building. You can see it from St. Charles Parkway just about. Um, it's, a, it's a, a massive structure there, and uh, students are in the building, and they are doing well in there. It's a beautiful place. It's, it's a work in progress still, we'll say that. Uh, but it is coming along very nicely and uh, good, good use is being made of the space uh, from the old portion of the building uh, that's still connected there. And so, so work in progress, but coming along very nicely. Benjamin Stoddard. After two years at the transition school, Eva Turner Elementary School is back in its location after a modernization and an addition. Um, and they're very happy. I think there's a YouTube video of the principal escorting the YouTube visitor all around uh, the school and showing off what a great job uh, supporting services did in that addition. And Dr. Brown Elementary School. So the picture you see is the transition school because that is where uh, the students and staff at Dr. Brown are currently housed for this school year because their building is undergoing a complete uh, facelift there where they are getting uh, enclosures, they're getting walls on the inside of that building and uh, it's been there since 1974 and so uh, they'll be happy to come back into a, a beautiful new looking structure uh, for next school year. Uh, I'm sure they'll be happy about it and so uh, this one is, uh, this is a picture of the transition school and I'm sure you'll see nice pictures of the uh, Dr. Brown coming soon. So as we move into the school year, all of our schools will be involved in diagnostic testing. Um, through the months of September and October, students in grades one through nine will have diagnostic tests in reading, English language arts, and in math. These are adaptive assessments, which means um, the you work on the computer and the questions get harder and harder. And as you uh, answer the questions correctly, they get harder and harder until they can find where your skill set is. If you miss a couple of questions, then the questions get a little bit easier. Um, and then when you're able to master those, they get a little bit harder so that the computer um, with the software figures out where exactly you are in reading and in math. Um, elementary school, it's about 60 minutes per subject. Secondary school, it's about 90 minutes per subject. And again, that uh, number is an estimate because it depends on how you answer the questions. Not everybody's gonna finish at exactly the same time. And MCAP testing, you heard a little bit about this a little earlier that we are just getting uh, this testing underway for our students in grades four through nine. And so uh, typically it is students grades three through eight, uh, but uh, fairly so the decision has been made to test uh, our students on last year's content. And so uh, we are uh, getting MCAP underway coming real soon. Um, the idea to, of course, measure how, how um, how well our schools are preparing our students to be college and career ready. So the staff here at Starkey is also very well aware that school has started. 
Um, student services is working through lots of programs that you've already heard about to make sure that they're meeting the social and emotional needs of students. Um, different software and um, lesson programs, Move This World, BASE, Second Step, Multi-Tiered Systems of Support is, um, um, used to be called SST. So now it's multi-tiered systems of support where you're finding out what students need and meeting their needs. Our Minds Matter, which is a mental health program, suicide awareness, um, and then just general mental health. It's been a rough time in our country. And so we know that we're, we stand ready to in, stand in the gap and help people where they are. Our special education office is also working to support schools with staffing shortages. No surprise that it's hard to find special education teachers. and so. They're helping schools make that happen the best that they can. They're providing virtual, um, so students who were accepted into virtual school that have IEPs, they all need IEP meetings to see if um, their needs can be met in that virtual instruction, so they're helping with those. They're helping coach teachers through professional learning, and then making sure that equipment and assistive technology is in the building with the students that need it. So as students move from place to place, um, perhaps their wheelchair or their um, physical therapy equipment needs to be moved from one building to another to be where the students are. And finally, to close with uh, support for our schools from a couple of other offices, the Technology and the Human Resources Office. Uh, certainly our Technology Department is working hard to uh, address uh, any damaged or uh, loss as it relates to the devices that we have provided for our students. Uh, we are continuing to transition our elementary, uh, transition our elementary school students to, uh, to be one-to-one -one, uh, with devices as well. And we are moving equipment to, to certain schools that have increased enrollment um, as needed and ensuring that the proximity learning, uh, students who are enrolled in the proximity learning classes have the technology that they will need um, uh, specifically those with cameras. Um, there are some devices that didn't have the cameras and so we needed to ensure that if anyone had cameras it was the students with uh, proximity learning teachers who are teaching them virtually. And out of the Human Resources Office, um, support is being provided by, uh, to our schools through uh, interviewing, hiring, and uh, employee assistance being made available to those, again, the mental health being um, an area of concern for, for not only students but also staff and so our Human Resources is uh, standing ready to assist our schools as well and then again with contact tracing so these are uh, some of the supports um, there, there are lots of uh, lots more support that's being offered but uh, we did want to conclude this presentation it's probably gone a little longer than we had expected uh, but hopefully that was uh, some good information for you regarding the opening of schools and at this time we are prepared to answer any questions you may have Oh, Miss Miss Abel, thank you very much for the update and also for the smooth opening of of schools that we had to everyone. Um, I have a three three to four questions here that were sent to me over the past week um, from parents or people in the community. S some of them I know the answer to already, but just to put it out there in public so everybody hears it. Um, I had question concerning elementary. Uh, students wearing masks during cardio and PE um, is it strictly if you're in the building you're wearing a mask no matter what or this PE this is elementary school gym class current, current guidance that we've received is is that if a student is involved in strenuous activity inside of the building they do not have to wear a mask okay. so if they are participating running from one side to another or participating in sports practices and things like that where they are actively involved in strenuous activity they can remove the mask that is a choice that they can make but they can also take it off but as soon as they stop they must put the mask back on okay thank you for that clarification uh next question is regarding the covid dashboard some parents um, and community members are wanting to see that broken down by school so um, we understand and fully appreciate the fact that there is a, a desire to have this aggregated data further than what we've been able to provide. Um, and believe me when I tell you, we are working on that. Okay. However, what I will say is, is that data that is released by school, which we have seen across um, in, the, in the DMV, the information that is, that is, that is on that date, that is on that 
by school is not a, there's no conclusions that can be drawn from that without context from each case there is a, an enormous fear that if someone were to say and just to use two schools for an example if someone were to say school a had 17 cases in it oh my god that school is off the hook those things are they're, they're, there's something going on with COVID. versus school b who only had three but school B, the three cases in school B were all connected as a community tracing. One student gave it to another, gave it to another. That's actually the portion that we need to be very concerned with versus school B or school A that has 17 cases and none of them are connected. They are all brought in from the outside. So I have some severe hesitancy in breaking it down that way because I don't want our principals to have to answer questions about why does your school have 17 cases and school B doesn't. Um, and much of what we have done thus far has been we published a list since October when we came in front of the board and had that long discussion about providing community notifications. Mm -hmm. And since that day, we have provided community notifications to every one of those communities for every positive case that we have been aware of. Um, I will end by saying that under Dr. Navarro's leadership, I requested um, a COVID call center because no one could see what we are experiencing right now. And I will go through that data if given the opportunity. Um, and we now have myself, Mr. Miser, plus uh, three other individuals that have been graciously um, temporarily duty assigned to us to make phone calls. Um, and um, I could not predict what we are seeing right now. And as a result of that, um, we are trying to get through the cases that come in every day by doing those interviews and contact tracing and finding out what we can to see if we can connect the dots on any of those cases because it makes sense as an organization and I believe we have a duty and an obligation as an organization to track those cases and to try and determine whether cases are, are starting in our schools and if they're spreading in our schools. Um, however, when you're averaging somewhere between 20 and 30 cases a day, and every one of those phone calls is involving concerned parents, those phone calls are not three second phone calls. So they take time, plus the additional notifications that need to be completed. As we, as we work through that, the hope is, and you will see one of the things that, that I am embarrassed about is the fact that we would love to be able to release quarantine data on how many students we have in quarantine. However, if I can't get through all the phone calls, the phone calls are the priorities to those families. I can go back later and try and track, how, track down how many students were placed in quarantine. I understand the desire from not only the board and not only everybody in our school system to have that data. The most important data from my standpoint is how many children we placed in quarantine that have gotten sick as a result of those exposures inside that school. And that's the data that, we are, that I want and that I want to be able to report. So we are pushing to be able to give more disaggregated data. It's going to take us some time because we did not, no one expected to see the sheer numbers that we are having right now. Thank you. Speaking of the sheer numbers, and with that in mind, uh, that leads right into the next question. Is there a certain number of cases um, that will be considered too high where we possibly have to shut down one or two schools? And if so, what's the magic number? So in the contact tracing world, there is um, two different ways to do contact tracing. One way is what we are seeing in many of our other schools. A neighbor to our north recently adopted a rule that if one student has um, displays one potential COVID symptom, they close the entire room. Um, this is one way of doing contact tracing. We have never done it that way. We have always done what we would call precision contact tracing. In other words, doing interviews with not only the student or the family and also the, the contact tracing that the schools are doing and also the students, but trying to figure out exactly which children met that requirement of the exposure that we talked about earlier. We have had two community spread cases so far this year, and in one classroom, I believe we had, um, I think, and don't quote, I believe it's up to eight cases that were related. There were 17 children inside of that classroom. That case is now over. There will be no more cases just because of the timeline for that. Think about the other 17 students that are inside of that classroom that were not exposed. And we have determined that over and over and over again through interviews, through video, through everything else. And if you are one of those parents, that were told, come pick up your child, your child wasn't exposed, but we're not real sure, so let's take them home and how much leave you would have to burn over and over and over again. That is why we participate in doing contact tracing that is precise and as precise as we possibly can. And quite frankly, these ladies, along with the 39 other or 37 other principals that we have, have gotten pretty good at it. Now, as we go through that, I do not believe there's a magical number. However, every situation is different and every case is different. 
We are investigating in the midst of investigating a third case that could involve a number of students. And if we get to a, if we get to a point to where there's one student left that hasn't been contact traced, I would understand the desire to take that class and potentially move it to a virtual a virtual location. However, keep in mind if we if we put these children out and they've turned sick, they probably aren't going to be in the in the in the idea to, to participate in online learning because they're sick. Just like with parents and or just like with our teachers, if our te teachers are positive. We have to ask ourselves the question is, are they able to teach at their 100% while they're sick? So no, the answer to that question is no. There is no magical number that we would shut down an entire room, an entire wing or anything else because every situation is different. And the two cases of community spread that we've identified so far have been highly unique on highly unique days with highly unique individual behaviors with highly unique situations that ha will not replicate themselves ever again. But that doesn't mean there won't be other situations that are just as unique that lead to a community spread case. Thank you. I have one last question before I turn it over to a fellow board member. Um, but before I ask that, the exposure slide that you had up on the screen was not included in the deck that was posted on board docs. So if someone could please have that included. Um, my last question involves high school students. It's been reported that students that are being quarantined and prohibited from coming to school are not being prohibited from attending school events. And they're sitting in the football student section and going to um, athletic practices when they're supposed to be on quarantine. Is there anything we can do to address that? Yes. So um, I reviewed the information that we received and I, I have no independent knowledge of this situation because it hasn't been reported to me in okay. those contexts. Um, I believe the game that they are talking about, there was several thousand students at that game um, or several thousand participants at that, as, uh, spectators at that game. Um, students that are placed on quarantine and isolation, they, it is just that. If you are quarantining, you are sick, or you are, or, I'm sorry, if you are quarantined, you are waiting to get sick or you've been exposed. If you're in isolation, you're sick. And those periods we've went over repeatedly up here. Um, with the numbers that we have, I would never expect that a school administrator or a school teacher working as a ticket collector um, at a Friday night football game would know each of the students that is, no, that is supposed to be on quarantine or isolation. As this event has been described to me, this is, a, this is, this is something that we need the parents help with. We need the students help with. If we tell a student that you've been exposed, we need them to do the things that are right, which is to stay quarantined for seven days. I wish I could say that there hasn't been situations, several, in which parents have refused to do that and still sent their kids to school. Not to activities, not to, not to, not to the after school activities or whatever else, to school that we then have had to grab as soon as they walk through the door, place in an isolation room and demand that the parent come and pick them up. Same thing goes with kids who have been on isolation. Isolation is 10 days. We have had students that have returned to school on day seven, eight or nine. And we've had to grab them and take them and put them back in the isolation room and take them out and have their parents come and retrieve them. So as this situation has been described to me, it could have happened. I'm not saying that it couldn't, however, I don't know what the Charles County Public Schools could have done to stop it because of the numbers of cases that we have. And at some point, we have to rely on the rest of this, our community to help us fight this. And I agree. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, I was bringing it forward so that the public could hear. I do not fault CCPS and don't expect you to know every child that should be quarantined <laughs> when they come into um, a football game. But I hope the public has heard quarantine means quarantine. It doesn't just mean from school. It means from the bus. It means from events. It also means from the neighborhood basketball courts, the grocery store, wherever else that the kids congregate. When they're quarantined, they should remain inside at home. Thank you. Mrs. McGraw. Well, to follow through with what Mrs. Um, Abel just said about the quarantine, I did ask for some uh, clarification today on, on quarantining because I've gotten a lot of questions about that. So I appreciate that graphic that went up. And I was gonna also mention that it, 
I didn't have it on my board doc, so. It was a late edition, my That's fault. Okay. Been a little busy, I'm sorry. That's quite all right. <laughs> but um, we could get it up there for everyone in the public to have that. That's a great diagram. Well, what I was gonna ask is, is I no did notice that um, there is a COVID link on the quick links now, so I thank you very much for doing that. Could we have that, because it's very quick to look at and read, could we have that graphic added to the quick links under the COVID heading? I assume that it's possible to be able to do that because I think just to quickly look at that is helpful to our parents and have to go through looking at a board, you know, the board meeting. Uh, okay, I have a couple of more questions. Um, one has to do with transportation. So what I'd like to know is um, I realize that we the contractors had to uh, hire a number of bus drivers because they were short. But I'd like to know what have the contractors done to support us in ensuring that all students are arriving safely at their destinations? I know that the schools go through, you know, a lot to make sure the kids are put on the correct buses. But I would like to know, have the new bus drivers been given any kind of training? Um, what's put in place before they get on that bus and drive a child home? Sure. Good afternoon. I'm Bradley Snow, Director of Transportation. Um, we've been working right along with our school bus contractors and school bus drivers to try to make sure that every student is provided a bus and has adequate transportation to school. Currently, we're still short um, about 11 buses. We physically do not have 11 of our fleet on the road currently. That's not to say we're missing 11 drivers. That's in addition to those 11 drivers because our contractors themselves are on the bus driving, their secretaries, their mechanics. Um, their sub drivers are all on a bus. So what we're running into now is not just sim simply the shortage of buses, those 11 buses. On any given day, there are a number of bus drivers that are just out, just as a school teacher would be out. So what they're doing is they're double backing, they're doubling up, they're um, putting uh, multiple runs on buses, which is extending the time that students are taking to get home. Um, also, we're running into uh, traffic issues all around the county uh, at the schools that are reliving, uh, providing late buses as well. Currently, we're setting up uh, driver training for this coming week. We have a number of drivers in that. So um, I talked to communications today about putting a link onto our um, homepage for our website, encouraging folks to apply through our contractor base and giving that information to our webpage, um, notifying them that we are looking for school bus drivers across the county and I can provide them the contractor's name and the process by which that takes place. The issue really isn't simply just getting a driver, it's the CDL process, it's becoming certified in Charles County to drive a bus, and then of course all of the background checks and the uh, drug screening and all of that, and all of that takes a great deal of time. It's not just simply posting today, interviewing someone this afternoon and putting them in a seat next week. This is really kind of a convoluted process that I think moving forward, as Dr. Navarro and, and we talked about today in ops, we're gonna have to come up with as a state, a, a better way to put people in the driving positions in a, in a much quicker rate um, than what we've seen. And obviously there are things across the state as we're seeing salaries and things of that rise that we're gonna have to make steps uh, to make more competitive things of that nature. Um, but their, their contractors are working to get drivers in seats. Um, unfortunately, the way that this summer played out after an extended period of time, many of the drivers um, turned in their resignations right prior to school starting. Um, and that can be for a number of different reasons, but that left us with a number of vacancies. And as I said earlier, the process by which it takes and the time to become certified, people don't have anyone kind of in waiting uh, because if you're a sub driver, you're not getting paid every day to drive a bus. You're just waiting until someone calls out and then they'll put you in that spot. So it's not something that you can have kind of a treasure trove of drivers that just pull from and put on the bus. So when someone leaves, it does truly create a vacancy for, for the most part. The folks that are sub drivers are just that. They wanna be sub drivers or they wanna do the occasional trip, whether it be an athletic trip or field trip, they don't wanna do daily routes. Um, so it has been a, an extreme challenge uh, for us to, to, to place drivers in positions. But like I said, we do have a driver's class and we run one uh, for the most part uh, each month and it's a three day program for the drivers to come in and that's just one step um, in the process of becoming a certified driver. Currently, you can't even jump from one county to another. Um, I can't take someone that moves from Calvert County a week ago, they move into Charles County. I can't just simply put them in a, on a bus, if, even though they were just driving two weeks ago for Calvert. 
That's just not how the process works. But we're working extremely hard. I want to thank everyone in the transportation office and the support of the uh, support services for doing everything that, that we can to get kids on a bus. Like um, we had mentioned earlier, we were flooded with tickets, um, help desk tickets and phone calls as we, as we started the year. A lot of that was because we weren't getting information into our routing software quick enough, having to reroute or consolidate about 11 buses. And that's three tiers in the morning. That's three tiers in the afternoon. All those students have to be placed on different buses and that has to be uh, not only processed, but then processed back to the contractor and then loaded in the software. So we are working hard. Oh yes, and in our office, of course, if their um, folks are off at a, at a route, what we haven't done, as many counties have done, and it's happening all over, is they just simply put out a text or an email alert saying a certain bus will not be picking students up today. We've seen that across uh, the state and, and, and even in our region. What we have been doing is we have a number of bus drivers, supervisors that are assigned to processing tickets or dealing with issues on buses or pulling video. Those people are completely unavailable because they're out driving a route for a bus contractor so that bus can still run typically on time and pick up students. So pretty much any given day we have uh, one or two folks from our office on a bus and I believe we've had as many as three or four on a bus uh, from our office out driving, physically driving routes. I just want you to know, I have no concern with what transportation has been doing because I know you've been working, you know, hard as you can. My biggest concern was what happens to those children once they leave our school and are on their way home. I want to be sure that the bus contractors and their drivers are in sync with what our guidelines and protocols are um, in terms of releasing children. So, so we're working real hard with that. We make uh, announcements throughout the day regarding obviously um, d issues with COVID, the windows, um, making sure that students are not left on the bus, that students or the drivers do a walkthrough prior to leaving the school or prior um, <clears throat> to dropping off in, in the afternoon and the morning. Um, some of the issue that we've been running into is drivers are covering other routes. They're in unfamiliar territory. They're servicing schools they're not familiar with, and they don't know the children. Um, we have had instances where new drivers and things of that nature are put on buses, um, and pre-K students or kindergarten students get on. They think that the parents are there at the stop, and they're letting them off. So we're continuously educating our drivers to make sure if it's a pre-K or kindergarten student, first and foremost, that the adult, the parent, receives the child at the stop, at the base of the stairwell, um, but also working with the schools to make sure that they're assisting the driver in knowing who is a pre-K and who is a kindergarten student, because that's our policy is to make sure an adult is there to retrieve them at the school bus. And then of course, making sure that bus is cleared, not before, the, not before they park it, uh, before they leave the school or after their last stop. Okay, thank you. And then I just have one last thing. Um, this has to do with homecoming. And I've got a lot of, you know, concerns. I've People have reached out to me regarding con what alternatives would what alternatives did you consider? Um, probably what led you to totally canceling them? Sure. So 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 we we had lots of discussion about about this and the the idea of the whole concept of a dance being uh, to, to socialize and and to get together and to sort of be face to face, if you will. Um, it, it just didn't seem responsible, uh, but we did talk, and not at this time, but we did talk about um, the possibility of doing something um, later, perhaps a, a, a winter formal, if you will, or something like that. We really want you know, things to settle down and hopefully move us in the right direction. Um, we, we talked about outdoor um, events um, and, and that being a possibility. Uh, we didn't really land on uh, that being something that we could do right away. The, the, the big part of this was that with the homecoming coming for McDonough High School this weekend, uh, time was really short on what we were going to do. And then we had to think about equity and all of that with all the schools. And so, so it's not off the table for us to consider, you know, something else. And we have been talking about it, but we haven't been able to make a a firm decision on, yes, we're going to proceed with outdoor events at this, at this time. We haven't just haven't had you know that discussion fully enough to say we're ready to do that uh, but there are some other ideas we just know that at this this moment in order to be equitable as well when thinking about um, all the schools um, we did have to uh, put a pause on it uh, given the nature of what um, you know the dances um, pretty much ask you to do um, to be in each other's faces and we know that we can't tell these kids <laughs> that they, you know, at a dance you know that's not happening to tell them uh, stay separated 
So that was a part of what that it, was. It's called hand, really hand dancing where I've come from. <laughs> right. It's called hand, hand dancing, uh, Dr. Jones, where I, I've come I, from. I remember that. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, yeah. We talked about that. We talked about should we connect when we do it outside? Can we have Can we all the children the on the football field and have a this dance is. on the football field? And it would be outdoors, but we still know that dancing is nose to nose, and that seemed a little counterproductive. We talked about a big tent, and we could rent seven big tents on seven different weekends and have a big tent in the parking lot, but we didn't think that we could house the whole high school in a tent. And then we're bringing in dates from other schools, because that's what homecoming is, and so we have to do contact tracing. Excellent. And if one person comes that's positive, and then you heard about this whole contact tracing, we talked about what the staff would be going through to figure out who was within three feet for more than 15 minutes over the course of a dance, and maybe they're from another school. We did talk about, well, maybe we could postpone it into the winter, and what would it, what would it look like if we required that you be vaccinated? Are you required to have a negative test? So we talked about that. We know that's what's going on in the world, and we're still talking about that. Um, we could do that now, but then we might have people say, oh, I didn't know that that was, I need a couple of weeks to, I can need a couple of months to get vaccinated. Um, we would encourage everybody to um, take a look, talk to their doctor and see if that's the best thing for them. But right now, and I think Mr. Stoddard alluded to it, we're getting so many positive cases a day. We're just trying to work the problem and figure out what we can do so that we can get to a situation where we can have a homecoming dance. We wanted to have a homecoming dance. We wanted to have an indoor pep rally. We want to have open house, but we need for people to not be positive and come into our schools. So if I can, if I may, um, speaking of those, those statistics, just to kind of give everybody, this was as of I walked through the door this more, the, to this meeting. We've got 173 student cases that have been reported to us in less than 11 days of school. We sit at 25 staff cases, and both of those numbers are from the 30th of August. Now, lots of people will hear those and go, oh my God, we need to close schools, or we need to take some other action, or we need to do it. But I think that the, the other side of that that we need to have a conversation about is how many of these cases are happening in the school and right now we have confirmed two cases and we are working on a third as we sit here today. The, off of the people that are over in the, in, the, in the center are working on a third right now. Now that does not mean by any means that there are not more. But what we know is, is that when we follow guidelines, when we follow our layered mitigation strategies that we have laid out for the last 19 months, they work. We have never said the goal of the Charles County Public Schools of our office has never been we're going to keep COVID out of the schools because that's unrealistic. What the goal has always been is to reduce the spread as much as we possibly can. And frankly, I think we are accomplishing that. So, and I know both sides will see this from one side or the other, and this is a polarizing discussion because, but then when you add in the virtual numbers where we're having trouble filling virtual spots and we're having, this is highly confusing and complicated for everybody that sits here. Um, and. I will, you know, one of the things that I think we, that, that, that we also need to talk about, number one, our schools, I do believe are safe. I do believe our schools are safe. Even though we have had 173 cases that have come in, we know from the numbers that we have in front of us that, uh, that 99 to 98% of those cases are coming from the outside. And when we do that contact tracing, because remember, as we talked about how that contact tracing works, it's two days, it's five days, you get exposed five to seven days later, you become sick. We see most of our cases come symptom onset five to seven days later, we trace right back to a weekend. We trace right back to a Friday, Saturday, and a lot of cases over Labor Day, weekend so we know that's happening we know they're not coming from the school don't get me wrong somebody's going to say we don't know that and we what, what I can tell you sitting right here is is we know of two cases on the, on the in 11 days there may be more and we're, we're committed to going to find those where they are reasonable but the other thing that I think we need to discuss is vaccinations were discussed 95% um, of those 173 student cases and 25 staff cases that we have are of unvaccinated people. And we have tracked that since August 30th, since the beginning of school. The 
cases that we have had, yes, there are plenty of people who will talk about how va or vaccinated folks um, are getting the virus and spreading the virus. 95% of our cases, I have it in writing, are of people who are unvaccinated. We know what works. The state of Maryland has been tracking um, breakthrough cases since January. They just started releasing it about a month ago. It's in our report daily. It's at 0.34% as of yesterday when I reviewed it. The single best chance to not get COVID, to not quarantine, to not miss practice, to not miss other sporting events is to be vaccinated and to have our vaccination numbers go higher. In school systems where we have seen 90 and 95, and there are several of them, private school systems in the state of Maryland where we have seen 90 and 95% vaccination rates among staff and students, they are having homecoming dances. They are not having cases, COVID cases. Their principals are not working six and seven hours a day doing contact tracing. I just want to say thank you very much for sharing that rationale because I think it was helpful for our community to understand the reasoning behind the decision. Thank you. Well, Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Um, not my original question, but just to follow up on that, you know, you, you used the term, I think you said layered defense, and that was uh, at the term that, that, that we used a lot um, in, in what now was my, my former job. But, um, <laughs> you know, when you... <coughs> when you get vaccinated, when you wear a mask, when you practice social distancing, when you wash your hands, you know, none of those things are 100 percent, but all those things together make it much less likely. Um, uh, another way to look at this is, you know, 40 years ago, if you were driving a car 60 miles an hour and you had to stop, um, and you knew you were going to hit something, there, there's a good chance that, that you'd be seriously injured or killed. Well. Today, there's a good chance that you're gonna walk away because you have anti-lock brakes and you have airbags and you can't buy a new car in the United States without either of those things because the data is very clear that when you have that, you have this kind of layered defense to, to reduce risk. And I think you hit the nail on the head, not to repeat it too much, but if I can make one plea to the public, you know, our, our rate of vaccination in the county is still like in the bottom quarter statewide. We, we need you know, more people in the county. Um, we have, correct me if I'm wrong, it's an FDA approved vaccine now, one 16, of them? For 16 and older, it's Pfizer. FDA approved. Pfizer. All right, so if that was a fear, it's FDA approved. And um, if that was one of the reasons that you weren't getting it, then, then please consider. Uh, my question was though, with regard to uh, the uh, virtual school and student enrollment, my math is right. Um, we allocated about two and a half percent of our um, of our K through eighth grade enrollment for for the virtual option. Is that consistent with what's happening across the state, or a little more, a little less? Okay. <laughs> so. Um, a couple of districts have uh, made some decisions to increase their original. So sometime during the summer, um, we had, for the most part across the state, there were somewhere between around 1.7 to about 2.4% of the student population. Um, some school systems increased the numbers. Uh, I think you might have seen Prince George's County increase its numbers slightly. Uh, some other places decided to institute um, additional spaces. Um, we checked in on a couple of those school districts, and um, one, of the, one of the things that, that is also happening is uh, the difficulty of staffing these additional virtual options. Sure. Um, so for us, you know, we are sticking with our current seats. Um, I personally uh, was a bit surprised on how many pleasantly surprised, if you will, um, how many families said no thank you to the option and have returned to in-person learning. Um, and we continue to work on filling those seats. Okay. And I think that's an important distinction to, to point out is that, you know, the virtual option is still not filled. And, and based on what you just said, we're on the very high end in terms of percentages of our K-8 population that we offer that virtual option to. And 
think what the public also um, can hopefully appreciate is that that's not free as I mean we're not just signing up for that and not having to pay for that is that correct I mean, that's an additional expense right I think the um, salaried expense um, for us to contract additional teaching supports is going to come close to about an additional million dollars um, that was not budgeted sure. when you all approved the budget for this upcoming school year all right so I think just just important thing for everyone to understand okay thank you very much I appreciate it this is battle Lockhart all right thank you guys for the presentation um since you have that up on the screen i'm gonna start with that question and i'm not gonna beat a, beat a dead horse i'm gonna give you a scenario maybe it can make sense to the public um i have two kids um one of my t both kids are vaccinated one of my t kids have contracted COVID. um the other one is not um so and both go to two totally different schools so with that scenario, what's supposed to happen as it relates to the school system instead of, instead of me telling you what happened? <laughs> so so if, you have, if you have a student who is, whether they're fully vaccinated or not, they can track COVID, um, they are out on um, isolation for 10 days. Okay, they must stay away for 10 days. The fully vaccinated student, as it says up there, if you're fully vaccinated and you're exposed to somebody, you can return to school. Be able to monitor, you monitor symptoms for seven days. You continue to wear your mask. You keep your social distancing, and you, if you, if your body tells you, uh oh, something's not right, you should then report it so that we can get tested right away. Um, a, but a vast majority of our breakthrough cases, I believe, as I described earlier, have may have, have been family member contacts where we have an unvaccinated person, either by choice or by age, who spends a great deal of time with somebody else. And just like no other, no vaccine is going to be 100% when you're living in an, a room that is that much um, thank goodness up to this point we continue to see breakthrough cases being very low so that student would be allowed to return under the current CDC MDH and the Charles County Public Schools policy the, the vaccinated student, student would be able to return to school uh, so the to just say to two boys the boy that goes to the different school within the, the brother the two brothers can go to school while the other brother stays home quarantined he would be isolated and we would ask the parents to please keep the children separate so i mean i know that you don't make the rules but for most people that think they're you know they want to make the rules <laughs> does it make sense if you have whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated a sister or a, and brother or brother and sister or whatever a brother and brother that lives in the same house and somebody has covid to send the sister or the brother to their school to with the possibility of being sick maybe however many days five to three uh, days i think i know where this i think you i know, know where saying? you're going yeah. i do and 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 i think on the on the face of it the question is is are we increasing the risk yes there's, there's an increase of risk to everything however see current cdc guidelines current cdc and we have said since the beginning we were going to follow what those governing bodies had told us we needed to do and it makes it very difficult for me to say in writing, I have that if a child is exposed to a known, a known positive person and they are considered vaccinated, that we need you to keep them home. Because if that parent fights that and says, hold on, the CDC, MDH, and your own written policy says that, we have nothing to stand our ground on. Yeah. And writing policy is highly difficult from every level. I have and routinely do tell parents, look, I can't tell you to keep your child home, but it's only a matter of time likely that your child's going to get COVID. Mm -hmm. Because especially if you cannot quarantine them. And we've had very emotional discussions with parents about the fact that I can't quarantine my children away from each other. And I understand that, I get it. However, our duty and obligation is to 27,000 students, not just to yours. So we have to protect everybody as much as we can. And that's where some of those tough decisions come from. Another scenario that we get all the time is mom and dad's positive, but they got an eight or a nine year old. You can't parent an eight or a nine year old while you're sick and expect that that eight or nine year old's not gonna be in your grill. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So what we end up having to do is, is we end up having to tell the parent you're, you're, from the date of symptoms, it's 10 days that you're considered contagious. If your son or daughter does not get sick in that 10 days, they have to wait another seven after the 10th day because you can infect your child on day 10. Mm -hmm. 
And so at times you're talking about 17 days that people are out depending and based upon the scenario that we are presented with. We have, I will tell you, we have examples of other public and private organizations that have went away from the CDC guidance as it relates to breakthrough cases. We have explored it. And I continue to monitor it, continue to explore it. But as I told you, as it sits here today, we're at 95% of our cases that we have are unvaccinated individuals. It would appear, and I would follow what the CDC released today, that the vaccinations are continuing to work eight, nine, 10, 11 months later after the initial vaccinations. Um, and that is why we have not evolved our contact tracing at this point. Could that happen in the future? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is communication, and I'm not sure if this is you or Navarro as it relates to um, how we communicate um, COVID. I, I know as a parent because I get emails, but um, to staff, there's getting a getting, um, couple different calls, emails stating um, some staff are not even aware they're hearing it from the parent or, you know, somebody that knows them said, hey, we got an email but they're not getting emails that it's somebody has COVID in their building. Did you guys like answer that? When we get notice um, and we conduct or begin or conclude the contact tracing process, then we work with the Office of Communications to generate the letters that go home uh, or, or sent electronically. But first we always send them to the staff. So our staff gets notification. The staff is going to be notified if a student in, in, in their classroom is positive because that's part of the contact tracing process. So we will always send out a letter to our staff, to the staff itself, and then we follow up with the letter to the community um, that we send out through School Messenger. But to that specific staff that probably was a part of that contact tracing, but the, not the entire team. Yeah, no, the, well, in, at the high school or the secondary level, a student is going to have multiple teachers. So all the teachers would be notified, yes. Yeah, okay. And I would add that we just recently received uh, the mandate that we use the school email system as well as school messenger. Okay. So school messenger goes to the parent community, also to the teachers that have opt in to receive those messages. But then as well, if we send it, if I send it to the list for Billingsley, then it covers my entire staff as well. Okay. So it may be sending it twice, but it assures that everyone receives mm -hmm. it. I would add to that two points. Number one, in, the, in those cases, I would suggest that that individual speak directly with their principal to find out why they're not receiving those. But number two, the other thing that we have seen, um, I have seen a drastic increase of over the last three to four school days has been parents calling saying, I know my kid was sitting right next to a positive per kid or this kid disappeared so he had to have COVID. And once we track those down and we're going to get those cases more and more and more and that bides into that rumor mill. Um, and we have, I have a lot of parents who, I am, who are sending me emails and I'm sure the schools are getting them too, <laughs> that this kid disappeared for two days, they had to have COVID and you didn't contact trace me. Yeah. Well, they probably did not come down with COVID. They had something else. So that leads to some of that misinformation as well. Mm -hmm. So we may have staff members who are hearing through the grapevine that there was a positive case when in fact there really wasn't. Gotcha. Or, and that is possible too. Okay. Because it's not parents. It's solely staff. They're concerned because they haven't been told. And I just wanted to see what the pro pro appropriate um, communication method is supposed to be. So thank you for that. Um, Oh, my eyes are going bad. I'm sorry. Ms. Per per Perello, I'm sorry. You mentioned earlier, and I just want to get clarification. You stated most schools are using QR codes. Now, are you referring to system-wide or only certain high schools are doing it and no other school? Who's all doing the QR codes is the question. Some of the high, my high school colleagues have shared with me that they are using the QR code system as well. Okay. And what determines who uses it and who doesn't use it? Well, we have never um, mandated that they use a QR coding system, but what we have said is that they have to have a reliable way of contact tracing students when they are, um, you know, wherever they are, including the cafeteria. Um, and so some are, are a bit more technologically, technologically advanced than, than some others, but they have other systems. So for instance, at Dr. Brown Elementary School, uh, they have a sign-in sheet as far as where they are sitting at lunch. 
And so they just, just maybe they have more supervision that is able to, you know, just sort of monitor that a little differently. Uh, but we've never mandated that they had to do it via the uh, QR uh, code. That just happens to work for Ms. Borello and, and several other principals. And so we, we support it as long as they have a reliable way of contact tracing folks that we can go back to later and get some, you know, uh, accurate information. Okay. I just, um, we, if we find a tool that works, Effective. I'm not. A, I know we're new, new at it, but if it's working well after we've used it for more than like three weeks, I mean consistency is the key, right? And the QR code t process to me, just I mean, if it's working, yeah, is that something sure. we can visit? But because then everybody, this is a system. This is not everybody willy nilly do what sure. they feel is right. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just a, if something we can look at. I'm, I'm not finished. Mm -hmm. Um, so just something to consider because it mm -hmm. kind of gives sends a different message to the community that everybody is doing something different and we're not working together, but we know we are, but the system seems as though we're not. That's all I'm just trying to put across. Understood. And um, I had a question um, on the previous slide about continuity uh, learning plan. What is exactly, and I don't know if we probably need to add this to um, an agenda, future agenda item, that you guys can kind of explain what that looks like and what it's supposed to look like across the system. Again, another system thing, because mm -hmm. apparently there's a disconnect of what it's supposed to be and what it's doing right now. And I believe, oh, my last question on another slide that you had, is the student services that you all um, mentioned. What tools, and we can talk about it at another place, but I just wanna put the question out there. How do we measure if those particular support systems or services are working for us in the way that we need to we need them to? The supports that we listed here on the supporting Yeah, schools, on there. So all the support the for the school and the ones for the students, how are we measuring? Because there's a lot. So how do we know which ones are the most effective? So you're thinking um, an agenda item for to Possibly. talk about? Yeah, we not okay. today. <laughs> I'm just the, yeah, based right. off of all the information you guys shared, I would love to us to kind of understand okay. that. And final question, I, I, I'm sorry, I see in my other note, know, is proximate proximity learning as well? Can you add that to the continuity learning plan as well, so we can know what that's supposed oh. to look like? Okay. Because apparently that start, you stated that starts on the 20th, but what's happening to those students with those students now because it hasn't started? So that's the question I would like to kind of know now because they're not in there right now. Sure. So, so and some, anyone else can chime in if you want, but I do know that there are there is staff in our schools that is responsible at this point for providing uh, asynchronous um, lessons and information. Um, preparing for uh, when the proximity learning teachers are available. Um, but they have, uh, like you said, the 20th is when they will start with the virtual school. There are some proximity learning teachers, individual teachers of individual classes that are working uh, because there are you know, some classes in, in our buildings that don't have uh, live teachers. And so, so those are, are, are ongoing. But as far as the virtual um, expansion, so those will begin on the 20th. But their staff, IOT members, uh, who are planning lessons for those for those students at this at this point until so we get the proximity to learning teachers on board. And over the past week, just to, we we have hired some teachers at the elementary level, and at the secondary level, uh, at the middle school level, to check in and work with <coughs> students. And they're sending out links to classes during that time period, and they're uh, delivering instruction to those students. Um, we we try to get that up and running a little bit earlier. Um, but with the beginning of school year, when we put out to uh, our staff that this was an opportunity, they needed that time within their buildings to really get set with their current students that are in the buildings. And so it took us a week later than, than we had hoped to get those uh, 
Charles County public school teachers to support our, our students virtually. So uh, this past week, we have been able to get some Charles County public schools working directly with these students. And they're actually working during their free time. Uh, not, I shouldn't say free time, nothing's free time. <laughs> they're working during their planning periods in their classes and supporting students during that time period. So they've actually taken on an extra period of students technically to really support the students in a distance learning format. But we are working with proximity to get the teachers up and running uh, on Monday for the virtual schools, uh, proximity <laughs> teachers that are uh, supporting students currently in the classroom when a principal had a difficult time hiring someone because there was no one available uh, to do in-person learning was supposed to start on Monday. Uh, unfortunately, they've had some difficulty with proximity with hiring folks as well. And so not all of those folks are in place. Many of them are in place, uh, but uh, we have folks are, we, we are now supporting some of those classes uh, from the central office with the IAs in the classrooms where there should have been a proximity teacher starting this past Monday. And we're working very closely with them to get that all of our teachers with proximity up and running by Monday, uh, both within the virtual and in the school settings. Okay, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Mr. Hurt. <clears throat> I'll, I'll keep my questions brief because I know we're behind schedule. And I wanted to thank Ms. Perillo and Ms. Robinson Taylor, who used to be my principal, uh, for, <laughs> for taking the time out of their day and, you know, skipping on the rest of their school day to come be with us. Uh, I just wanted to bring it back to homecoming real quick. A concern that weighs heavily in what I'm hearing from students is that if we move forward with postponing it uh, as the weather gets colder we are going to close off that option to have an outdoor venue mm -hmm. and force our hands at having it indoors if at all and that makes it even less likely to happen and uh, another point I wanted to bring up and me and Mr. Hancock were conferring on this point is that students are okay with moving the goalposts. I think students would rather have a homecoming with certain rules in place like proving uh, either vaccination or a negative test or other mitigation factors that are out of the scope of a regular school day to ensure that this happens. And uh, I just hope that uh, school administration, if they do move forward with planning this, would look at counting on our students to be responsible and make those decisions and enforce it on each other as well. Uh, just being responsible, social distancing, et cetera. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. Mr. Hancock. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you guys so much. And uh, just to follow up, I, I don't really have a lot of questions. Um, I just would like to follow up with Ian and I were briefly talking and I would support him if it's okay with the students at a later date when hope to God things start to go in the right direction if we could provide something these kids have been through a lot and uh, uh there's been enough senior classes gone without things that we've all had and i think we should keep that in mind um if if, if it's got if we got to provide a negative test or a vaccine to hold a prom or, or, or homecoming at a later date i think we ought to keep that in mind um, aside from that, my questions have all been answered. Uh, I just want to say thank you guys so much. You guys are all working so, so hard. Jason, I know you probably ain't slept in two months. <laughs> um, but it doesn't go unnoticed. The, the biggest thing is that we have kids in school. And Jason, you brought up some data. There's some rumors out there that all oh, the schools are going to get shut down and go back to virtual. If that were to happen, I don't, I don't see the point. If 95% if of the cases are occurring outside of school, the, the cases are still gonna happen. And we're, we're almost two years into this thing now. And let's say we go five years of doing virtual. What is the long-term effect of that student's life, of our country's life, of our lives? We have to live with this as long as, we, as, long as it's here. And I think it's always gonna be here. And um, I just wanna say thank you guys for for keeping the main goal, the main goal, and that's having kids in the classroom. To give you a positive note, um, my daughter started pre-K this year. And Friday, so last week was her first week of school. Friday afternoon, she was crying. She's crying and crying and crying. So what's wrong with you? She said, Mom said I can't go to school tomorrow. I said, are you kidding? 
<laughs> I said, well, the school's not open tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, uh, it's, there's some good things going on out there. And um, I agree, you know, the, the vaccine is the answer. Um, ivermectin is not. I raise cattle. <laughs> we use ivermectin. It's a pour on dewormer and we wear gloves when we use it. So uh, keep up the great work. Thank you all so, so much. And hopefully you guys get some rest and, uh, and just know it doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you. I'd also like to thank you for your presentation. This was very informative. I don't think the general public even has a clue as to all the work that it, it's taking mm -hmm. to really have these kids back in school. So like I said, I said before, social media is good, but you don't get the right information off of social media all the time. I just would like for parents to be able to come to the source that they need to come to to find out correct information. Go to the website, look at the information, but find out all the work that's going into getting these kids and keeping them in school and keeping them safe. Thank you. So we, obviously this is an extremely important topic. It was a great presentation and thank you for your hard work in answering our questions. Obviously we could go on about this. I think we all can agree that we want normal. But what we need right now is we need all hands on deck. I think we have expressed it enough uh, without opinion or political bantering. We want normal and we want the, the student experience that we experienced when we went through school. So with that said, we appreciate the adjustments and the adaptations as a look across the room to the to the staff we're, we're always uh appreciating the teachers we love the teachers but mrs perillo and uh mrs robinson taylor tag you're it you're representing the principal core um and as my colleagues um have already st stated we we know we feel we appreciate the principals, your, your sisterhood, your brotherhood, your vice principals, because you have taken on a huge role involving health policy. And what I'm finding uh, uh, and assessing is that Charles County Public Schools is doing well. We're managing the exceptions, and that's what we will continue to do. I don't think there are quote unquote system wide challenges. And the one thing that I'm very impressed about CCPS and, and the leadership, two best examples sitting before us, is we adjust and we continuously try to solve problems. So I ask the public's patience, give us the opportunity, give us the problem, give us the details, and it's a it's proven we're always going to work towards success. And why? Because we all want normal. So thank you again. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank and you. We appreciate your hard work. Thank you. So we're going to make a change in the agenda um, because the presenter has a flight to catch. And we're going to take on the compensation study and then take a pause. Right. so once once Thank you, Ms. Wilson. yes apologies we have a, we, one of our consultants who is traveling later this evening and so we just asked to switch the, the oh. items and everybody's coming up and then once once we do this we'll, we can take a break yes it's your meeting Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you on the table. <laughs> Uh-oh. It's on. It's on. Yeah. Are you okay? All right. A good afternoon to our board members, our school community employees, and the viewing public. On behalf of Superintendent Navarro, 
and the Office of Human Resources in partnership with AFSCME, our Office of Fiscal Services, and the Management Advisory Group. We are happy to bring you an update on our compensation and classification study. We began this initiative a year ago now, and we could not have done it without critical input from our support staff employees across the system. So the information you hear today may or may not surprise you, but hopefully will move us all to action in terms of addressing the need to position our pay structure in a way that allows us to successfully compete with the local economy, with our metro market, in terms of attracting talent to the school district and retaining that talent once they're here and uh, grow their careers with us. So with that in mind, let me allow my colleagues at the table to introduce themselves, and then I will turn it over to our outside consultant to present on our compensation and classification study. Ms. Birch. Sarah Birch, I'm asked me President Local 2981. Good afternoon, David Shimizu, Manager of Compensation and Classification and HRS. Karen Acton, Assistant Superintendent of Fiscal Services. All right, and with that, we will turn it over to Mr. Campbell, who will explain the compensation study. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to accomplish this afternoon, first of all, is give you an overview uh, of the project, uh, talk a little bit about the methodology and approach that we use to design and develop the study, uh, then talk about some of the uh, findings and recommendations and the next steps uh, uh, moving forward. As uh, Ms. Major said, we've been working on this project for about a year, and uh, we have got we have uh, solidified the report, uh, but that's not the end from our standpoint. We'll continue to advise and assist the district as it uh, figures out uh, the implementation approach uh, that it needs to take to implement the study. Just briefly, uh, we are a company based out of Fairfax, uh, Virginia, uh, 25 years uh, in the business, worked in 40 states. Uh, we specialize working in, in the public sector. Uh, school districts, municipal, county government, as well as public safety organizations. We've probably done over 500 of these studies uh, since the company was uh, 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 open, and I've probably done uh, about 180 uh, personally. Uh, I've been an HR director, uh, a deputy city manager, and I've worked in probably six of the largest school districts in the country uh, doing consulting. Uh, Philadelphia, I'm currently in Houston Public Schools now. Uh, also done some work in Miami-Dade uh, and New York City. The project was designed to capture information from the employees relative to their duties and responsibilities. Um, and in order to get that information, we had the employees complete uh, a questionnaire that was designed specifically for the district that allowed us to gauge their duties and responsibilities and use that information to conduct what we call a job analysis based on our criteria to uh, establish the internal hierarchy of positions within uh, the district. With respect to just general understanding of compensation design, and this is not unique to our company or me as a consultant, it's a two-stage process. The first step is to have some type of criteria and a mechanism to be able to evaluate the jobs internally, to be able to differentiate levels of pay of the internal jobs based on some type of uh, verifiable uh, criteria. The second step is to address the external uh, marketplace uh, to come up with a list of other organizations that have similar types of jobs uh, that uh, competes with the organization under study uh, for labor. In other words, those other organizations are recruiting from the same uh, labor pool. So you've got to, just to recap, you've got to internally rank the jobs within the uh, organization under study, and then you've got to identify uh, comparable peers out in the marketplace and see what they're valuing for similar jobs. And so the uh, second bullet says the uh, uh, internal equity analysis, which was done. I'll talk a little bit about that specifically later in terms of the criteria. Uh, number three talks about the uh, market adjustments and those other peers. I'll identify the peers that we compared uh, the district to. Uh, that was a list that was mutually developed uh, by uh, MAG in association with administration. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, the implementation plan that we've come up with in terms of the price tag of uh, implementing the study and then some of the uh, steps we've uh, put in place uh, mm -hmm. to maintain the study going forward. Uh, in this line of work, you typically, from a best practices standpoint, 
you want to conduct a compensation study every five or six years. Um, based on the information we were <clears throat> uh, presented with, it has been some time since the district has done a study. And we hope going forward that as part of uh, your compensation philosophy, which we did uh, present a draft of a philosophy document, that one of the items in that philosophy document is that the board consider uh, formally uh, committing to do a compensation study every five or six years, if funding allows, of course. Mm -hmm. What the project was not designed to do, we did not uh, evaluate individual performance or capabilities. This was an assessment of the value of the job, not the value of the person. The value of the person should be considered with respect to a performance review. Uh, from our standpoint, labor is commodity driven by the same principles of supply and demand. We did not guarantee salary increases uh, to any of the employees at the onset of the study. Uh, I've been doing this for 18 years. I have not done a study in the 180 plus that I've done that there were not uh, salary uh, recommendations uh, uh, put forth in the report. We did not make any recommendations to reduce anyone's pay. Even if we found someone that was above the top step in the salary schedule, we would not recommend reducing their pay. We did not address staffing issues. Uh, within the departments, whether they were overstaffed or understaffed. We did not make any commentary in terms of eliminating or adding additional positions or addressing any other staff related uh, issues within the districts. The overarching big picture goals, we wanted to make sure that this particular study based on the request for proposal that went out was for the non-teaching positions. We wanted to uh, compare, as I said earlier, the district to other uh, employers in relevant labor markets, and you'll see that we have about 16 or 17 different uh, organizations that we took a look at. We want to make sure that jobs that have equal responsibility, requirements are similar, that they're paid on the same uh, salary schedule or same salary range. We did find that because there has been such a uh, long time between studies that there are some jobs that took on or have evolved with more duties and responsibilities than they had maybe four or five, six years ago, but it wasn't reflected in the current level of the pay structure. And so we basically reshuffled the deck and brought things back in the balance with respect to making sure that the jobs and the compensation associated with those jobs represents uh, internal as well as market uh, value. One of the things that's often an issue in school districts is when you come in, they have multiple salary schedules. Uh, which makes it difficult from an administrative to standpoint to, to manage them. What we've done is we've come up with a master uh, salary schedule, put all the non-teaching positions in that one salary schedule to make it easier to manage, um, and then provided some uh, uh, guidelines and procedures on how that information needs to be presented to employees and explained with respect to how they can determine what their annual compensation is from reviewing that master schedule. We also provided uh, some policy guidance in terms of salary administrative guidelines with respect to demotions, promotions, and transfers to make sure there's consistency in how the HR department handles, handles those issues going forward. We've also designed policies, for example, to address teleworking. Um, that has become a huge issue uh, in light of the pandemic. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we found that a lot of organizations, not just this organization, did not have formal written policies that govern working uh, remotely or working away from the office. We've also uh, de uh, developed some policies with respect to incentive compensation for those positions where the employees go out and earn additional licenses or certifications. For example, in the trades area, it's pretty, a pretty common practice in local government and school districts to provide some type of mechanism to encourage individuals to enhance their skill set by going out and getting additional certification or, or licensures and areas like electricians, plumbers, carpenters, uh, those things should be weighed in terms of the value to the district uh, and the value to the individual for gaining those additional uh, skills. And all told, there were about 1,449 positions of people in the study, uh, about 200 plus classifications as a part of the study. I won't spend a lot of time on this uh, particular slide, but as I said, in terms of capturing data, the employees complete the questionnaire it generally takes about an hour and a half to do the questionnaire. We gave them two weeks to do it. The supervisors had the opportunity to go back behind 
the employees and review the information that was sit, uh, submitted to make sure that it was accurate and nothing was left out. To protect uh, the voice of the employees, the supervisors could not change or alter the original submission. It was locked into a PDF format, but it did allow out to uh, the side of each question uh, for the supervisor to make comment if he or she did not agree with the information for, uh, that was uh, provided. An example of a common uh, uh, question that sometimes there's a difference between what the employee says and the supervisor is education level. From our standpoint, we want to know what's the minimum level of education needed uh, for a given occupation. Perhaps an employee put down bachelor's degree. Well, the supervisor may comment, well, historically, we've uh, hired people with uh, a high school diploma and maybe an associate's degree or some uh, uh, technical college uh, credit. So those are generally the type of issues where there are some differences of opinion. And any time we found uh, questionnaires of that type, they were red flags set aside, and we went back through human resources with Ms. Majors and her staff to verify any information where we got conflicting responses uh, from the employee and, uh, and the supervisor. Uh, we did identify some positions where we thought the classification or title was outdated. It did not represent what we consider best practices in today's labor market. And so we made uh, a recommendation to alter a few titles to bring them in line of what you typically see in a school district of this uh, type and size. Uh, we, once we developed a new structure and system, we calculated the cost by department, by employee, uh, to show the impact to each individual and what it's going to cost the district to transition to uh, the new salary schedule. What you have before you are what we call job responsibility factors. This is a criteria that we use to establish that internal hierarchical relationship I talked to you about. There are 14 uh, data items or, or job factors that we look at in terms of, in terms of uh, conducting that job evaluation. Uh, the first item is called uh, data responsibility. Here we're basically looking at any types of records, reports, or documents that are either reviewed or designed by the respective employee could be something as simple as an incident report, maintenance report, purchase order, requisition, or it could be as comp uh, complex as a budget document or a strategic plan. Once the employee provided us with a list of their uh, job duties or tasks, we we're able to make <clears throat> some uh, uh, decisions relative to how judgment is exercised in that position. We also looked at uh, people responsibility from a standpoint of does the individual supervise, coordinate, or lead others uh, in their respective department. Uh, the complexity of the work was taken into consideration. Asset responsibility with respect to managing a budget or being responsible for equipment or materials. Impact of decisions if the employee, well, once we identify the task, if an individual exercised poor judgment or made uh, poor decisions, what's the impact to the district? Could there be legal or financial uh, issues or could there be uh, uh, loss of life or, 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 or injury to, to anyone uh, within the organization? Education experience, we're not asking what the individual employee holds, but we're trying to make sure that when the job or position descriptions are posted for vacancies, they accurately reflect the minimum <coughs> level of, of qualifications for a given position. You can always hire above that, but there needs to be a baseline with respect to every job in terms of what the education level and the experience level should be. And we benchmark that against industry best practices. We also want to know what type of equipment individuals working with, any physical demands associated with the position, uh, communication, who are they interacting with internally, externally, and how are they inter interacting and communicating, any mathematical or statistical computation associated with the position. And then there's something we call unavoidable hazards. Unavoidable hazards are those things that potentially could cause harm to the individual in a certain job. For example, uh, I noticed that uh, at one school there were some guys out mowing the lawn. Well, in the summertime, there are bees, wasps, and snakes, and things like that. That's an unfortunate consequence of having to do that job. Electricians are exposed to electrical wiring and things of that type. So we wanted to identify any specific hazards. And then safety of others. Every employee has some responsibility to enforce safety rules and regs. The higher you go up in terms of the uh, chain of command, you inherit more responsibility for the safety of others. So as a consultant who sat down and reviewed uh, the 1,400 plus uh, job questionnaires and job descriptions, I assigned a complexity rating that ranged from one to 10 in each uh, one of those categories to come up with a quantitative point score for each position. That's how we established that hierarchical relationship, identifying what we call the most complex job, which is the top scoring overall position, and then in descending order, 
the least complex uh, position um, based upon the lowest overall point score. That establishes our internal relationship. And then you see this graphic here. This just summarizes what I've talked about up to this point. In order to design a salary system or a compensation system, to the left, you've got to address the internal equity. You're taking information from HR, from any employee uh, communication documents, the uh, job analysis questionnaire to facilitate that uh, uh, job analysis. Then to the right, external equity. You've got to address that by identifying peers and competitors. Uh, typically speaking, we generally draw a circle uh, that's about 150 mile radius and sometimes even greater uh, to identify players within that, that radius. The request for proposal specifically stated that uh, you wanted a consultant to look at organizations that I believe were about 75 miles uh, within the district. And so we have some districts that are in some of the bordering states, which I will show you shortly. Once you've satisfied the internal and the external, you have to use some type of statistical modeling technique to validate uh, the information. And so we use a technique called linear regression, uh, which looks at the relationship between the job evaluation quantitative point score and the market average value in terms of the job worth from the peers. And the regression model then predicts or projects what the new salary schedule should look like. This allows us to attach a certain level of validity and reliability uh, to the uh, recommendations in terms of value of the jobs. We have had uh, the opportunity to uh, testify in uh, legal proceedings with respect to how to validate uh, job worth and job value. Uh, our principal founder is one of the few people in this industry who's actually uh, been vetted by the Fourth Circuit federal court system with respect to pay equity issues. And so <clears throat> she reviewed the uh, recommendations in the initial report before I presented them to the, uh, to the district to make sure there were no issues. Peers or target organizations we looked at as a part of the process. Of course, we're gonna look at other school districts. And then we looked at general government and a couple of organizations because there are some positions that exist here that also exist in city and municipal government. But starting out, we looked at St. Mary's County Public Schools, Calvert County, Anne Arundel, Baltimore City, and county schools, uh, Howard County, Frederick County. And then next up, we had uh, several general government organizations, Charles County, City of Baltimore, Washington, D.C., City of Wilmington, City of Alexandria, Martinsburg, West Virginia, uh, Hanover, Pennsylvania, Prince George County, uh, and then some other school districts, uh, Carroll County Public Schools, uh, Alexandria City Public Schools in Virginia, Arlington City Schools in Virginia, and Washington County Schools, uh, of course, here in Maryland. Those are the organizations that we collected uh, data from with respect to the value of certain positions within those districts. And so once we collected that market data, we began to analyze it and review it to kind of paint a picture of where the district was in the marketplace. That picture was not a pretty picture. Uh, the district uh, lags behind uh, both ends of the salary range spectrum. And by the salary range spectrum, what I mean, if we look at a salary schedule, you're going to have step one, then you're going to have a mid-step, uh, and then you're going to have a top step in respect to the value of a given position. That step one is often referred to as the minimum or the entry-level salary for a given position. That's the salary for someone who just meets the minimum qualifications. Uh, someone who's probably relatively new to that uh, career or occupation. On the entry level salaries or the minimums, the district's 9.5% behind the market uh, uh, sample. Uh, at the midpoint, a market average, which is where typically an individual wants to be paid at because the midpoint is considered the competitive rate of pay for someone who's fully proficient and qualified at their occupation. They've gone beyond the learning curve. At that juncture, the uh, district's about 9.4%. And at the top end uh, value of the sample size, the district is about 9.4% behind as well. From a compensation standpoint and consulting standpoint, anytime you see negatives greater than 5%, that tells you a couple of things. Number one, it tells you the district has a compensation plan or, or salary schedules that are not competitive overall. Number two, it probably tells you that the district since the Great Recession of 2007-2008 probably has not 
done a very good job in trying to uh, catch up uh, with the marketplace. During the Great Recession, a lot of organizations froze salary, rightly so. Revenue was not available. Many organizations have uh, acknowledged that and doubled down to catch, catch back up and, and, and get back to a competitive position. Others, either maybe uh, the resources still aren't there or the political will is not there, uh, and they've not done so. Next slide, please. And so an example of some of uh, the positions from the market uh, uh, sample size that did have competitive pay in, in the district currently, uh, the food service workers uh, were in pretty good shape, bus attendants, uh, supervisor of operations, building services assistant manager, and accounting assistant. Uh, and this is just a sample, there are others. And then we have the positions that were below uh, the market greater than 5%. Uh, some of them were double digit behind the market in terms of individual positions. Uh, a big concern was your, uh, your trade positions, your mechanics, uh, electricians, HVAC. But surprisingly, the occupational group that was close to 30% behind the market were your instructional assistants, which is odd because in most districts I work uh, with, because uh, a lot of districts have passed down a lot of responsibility to the instructional assistants mm -hmm. to free, it, to free up the teachers uh, to, to do more things. They've generally uh, acknowledged that additional responsibility by increasing the pay of the instructional assistants. I did not find that apparently based on what the market shows me here in this district. They were significantly behind. And the majority of the monies uh, to implement the new study, a significant amount of that money is devoted to bringing the instructional assistant salaries up to a competitive level. Those folks are woefully paid for the work that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, other positions that were below the marketplace, uh, as I said, uh, HVAC mechanic, guidance secretary, uh, and storekeeper, and payroll accounting position. And so the new structure we put together, we called it a unified plan for the district. We put all the jobs in one plan, about 270 job titles. We created a step structure that has 27 steps from step one all the way up to uh, 27. There's 2% increments in between steps. There's 31 grades overall. And the range spread from step one to step 27, or from minimum to max, is 65% which is consistent with what we found in the other organizations we looked at. And then if you look at the uh, new master schedule from a vertical standpoint, going from grade one, two, three, all the way down to grade 31, there's a 5% uh, uh, break between the grades. And what this structure achieves is it provides a competitive uh, position for all the uh, uh, positions that were subject to the study, which are the uh, non-instructional positions. It makes the entry level salaries higher and more competitive. Um, when I talked with some of the uh, uh, leadership, um, they expressed frustration that it takes months to try to fill some positions. And then when you do uh, receive the applicant uh, uh, packages from HR, uh, the vast majority of them don't meet the uh, minimum qualifications because the pay is so low. They're just not going to uh, apply for the jobs. And you have to understand when it comes to the trades jobs, particularly, you're competing head to head with the private sector. Uh, when the economy is good and construction and buildings taking place, electricians, carpenters, plumbers, they can find work pretty much anywhere. So one of the things that I often tell the uh, school boards or, or, or county commissions, when we say competitive pay, I'm not saying you've got to be the top paying organization in your region. If we look at pay on a spectrum from one to 10, a one would be an organization that pays sub, uh, substantially below market uh, uh, wages, benefits are probably poor as well, you can't sustain quality service at, at that one level. You become a training ground. People get their experience and they move on. At the 10, because you're a public entity, you don't have an infinite source of revenue. You can't just go out and jack up prices and generate more revenue. So you can't sustain being at the 10. There's only one public or quasi-public entity that I've seen that pays superior wages within its market. And those are the electric cooperatives in most states because they have little oversight uh, they're member owned and pretty much they don't do, you notice they don't do a lot of advertising. They kind of stay behind the scenes and, <laughs> and kind of do what they want to do and they pay quite well. But in order to be competitive, if you can get to a situation where you're around a seven or eight overall on that scale of 10, you can compete because the ranges are high enough. If you found a, an exceptional applicant who exceeded 
by a vast amount of the minimum qualifications, you can move up to make a competitive offer. If the salary schedules are done correctly and they're competitive, probably 75% of the people you hire, you're gonna be able to bring them in somewhere around step one to three. Uh, for technical jobs, uh, middle management, senior management, you're gonna to have to come up you know, closer to the, the midpoint of the uh, salary schedule, but you should never have to bring anyone off the street above the midpoint of your salary schedule. If you're doing that, then your, your pay schedules are obviously uh, low and, and not competitive. The other aspect of this, I've been talking a lot about direct compensation, which is your salary or, or, or bonuses and things of that type. The other component is known as indirect compensation. And this is where you look at your benefit items. Uh, and today, uh, most organizations are putting a big premium on quality of work life issues, uh, more so than some of the traditional uh, retirement uh, and health insurance things. When I looked at your benefits package, it is very good, very competitive. There are no problems there. It's direct compensation where you have the issue. When you take together and consider your direct compensation and your indirect compensation, we call those things uh, total rewards. Mm -hmm. Direct compensation and indirect are your total rewards. And there's a, a somewhat of a tsunami on the, on the horizon as more and more people retire and, and leave and you're recruiting younger and younger people into the workforce, particularly uh, millennials and some of the occupations within the district. They're not as concerned about retirement and those things that we typically were concerned about uh, when we took a job. They're more concerned about time off, uh, incentives, and what are you gonna do for me? Mm -hmm. And so over the next uh, one to two years, I think the district would be wise to, to relook at, at how uh, it recruits and retains. Uh, I, I think uh, as you look out in the landscape now, uh, organizations are getting more creative to attract talent. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of clients that um, if an individual comes to work for, the, for their district and their performance reviews are, are meeting expectations uh, during the first five years, they guarantee X amount of dollars that go towards their student loan debt. Um, we've got organizations that are offering signing bonuses for some positions, bus drivers, uh, in many uh, uh, districts and, and many states are hard to find. Um, many organizations are offering uh, recruiting or retention bonuses to keep them paid out over, o over time. And so you're really gonna have to think outside the box with respect to how you recruit and retain talent. But it all begins by uh, making sure that you have a salary schedule that's competitive. Uh, and although it wasn't part of the scope of work since we had the data, and we were reaching out to these organizations, we did provide under separate cover uh, salary uh, information for the senior management jobs as well. Okay. So what, what did we find and how much does it cost to move or put the district uh, in a position to where uh, it can turn things around? Uh, to implement the study right now is $3.5 million. It changes current payroll by six and a half percent. Again, we use our 5% barometer. So anytime you see the change in payroll as a result of a compensation study greater than 5%, that means you got some work to do uh, and, and, and maybe you haven't uh, done salary adjustments to the tune of some of your peers out there in the marketplace. I need to caution you that this $3.5 million does not include any benefit costs such as FICA. This is raw salary dollars. That a, a, will be an a annual re reoccurring cost. I will say this, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close, uh, close out and, and certainly uh, address any uh, uh, quest, questions you may have. There is a temptation by some organizations who uh, go out and bring in someone to do a, a compensation study, and maybe uh, their initial reaction is, well, we don't have the 3.5 we'll just kind of cherry pick the ones that appear to be the most out of whack. I would highly encourage you not to do that. In my mind, and for good reason, this is an all or nothing approach. Either you implement it 100% or you hold on to it till you can. Uh, because what you will do is create an environment where there are winners and losers. You're gonna pit one group of employees against another. And that's never a good way to do business. So I highly encourage you uh, to figure out a plan uh, maybe not this fiscal year or maybe fiscal year 23 to position yourself to implement the entire thing at one time. 
that would be the prudent move uh, in my position. And I know as a school district, you have to deal with your, your friends across the street over the county uh, in terms of funding. Sometimes that's not a pleasant task, so I understand that. But uh, I just want to say there are some really hardworking people uh, in this district. I, I sat in the room next door. I've been here since uh, 9 o'clock this morning. And when this meeting started, I was listening in, and I heard several of you uh, as board members uh, you know, express uh, gratitude to the employees for the hard work and, and things they've done during the pandemic. And I'm sure they're saying, well, we really appreciate it, but I guarantee you folks like the instructional assistants are saying, hey, show me the money. Show me the money. That, uh, in a nutshell, is, is, is what we did, how we did it, and, and, and what it's going to cost to do it. We will uh, continue to be available to uh, provide guidance uh, if the district wants to look at some alternative uh, implementation plans. Uh, we certainly uh, will provide uh, guidance in those, those areas. If there are any initial questions, I'll be happy to ask. If you come up with questions later, uh, whether it's today or later in the week, if you just provide them through the superintendent and Ms. Majors, I'll be happy to respond in writing to any questions that way as well. Mr. Lucas. Yeah. Mr. Campbell and Mag Management Associates groups have, have really done an outstanding job of digging in to our compensation concerns and looking at our data and have given us some terrific suggestions. So I really want to thank them for the work that they have done. Um, he was polite in saying that we haven't done a study in a number of years, but to be honest with you, I could not find anyone that could tell me when a study was done. So I think it has been many, many, many years, and some of you who may have worked here um, and retired from CCPS, you may have experienced a study or been aware of it, but I couldn't find evidence of one. So I'm very grateful um, to the prior administration for authorizing the study and, for the, and to the current administration for showing uh, a sincere interest uh, in doing something to um, look at our support staff compensation. So I just want to share that. Um, and with that said, we have not made any decisions yet. Mag has given us some outstanding recommendations in concert with our superintendent, as well as Ask Me Leadership, and obviously our Office of Student Services, which is why Ms. Acton's at the table. We will be coming together to collaborate and talk about how we're going to move forward. We are always, you know, looking for um, dollars to support our compensation needs each year when we come to the table for bargaining. But aside from that, we now know that we are very much behind in terms of compensation. So when you're out in the community and you're talking to community members and families about the challenge of maybe I didn't accept a job with CCPS, it's because we're not competitive in terms of pay and we need to do something about that but like you know it, it takes a village right to to bring about change sometimes so we all have to work together but I'm very grateful for the work that Mag has done as well as all of these folks sitting at the table in our new administration so we will absolutely be collaborating to make some decisions about how we're going to move forward and I just want to make sure that that is very well known to our employee community who is probably watching this presentation. Questions for Mr. Lucas? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I was going to start off by, by saying a lot of what, what Ms. Major said. You know, this is something that that we've known about for a while and it's and it's good is not the right word, but to see it quantified is is very helpful. Um, and, and particularly with the IA issue, we've known uh, about that. And so I just want to thank you for a very, a very good presentation. My one question is, when there was 270 job titles, is a job title take an electrician? Is electrician job title or electrician one, two, three, are those separate job titles? Because many organizations don't have the career ladder, and that's what we call it in HR, where you have a, a base job, yeah. and then based on, uh, additional skill set, you may break it out into a one, two, and three series, or one and a senior. So we always take the base, because we, we're generally able to find that one. And then once we 
determine the value for the base, we can build on, on the additional uh, classifications within that series. Okay, I'm just, I'm just thinking, so we have 270 distinct positions that are under the ASME umbrella? Yes. Wow. Okay. It's a little more than I would have thought. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. That's great. Thank you. So let's thank you. I appreciate for you. I appreciate it. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break. Oh, good work. Thank you, Carl. I'd like to welcome everybody back. Next on our agenda, we're going to have a, a, a presentation on mental health. Yes, Good afternoon, Kee everybody. I'm Kathy Kiesling, Director of Student Services. And with me today, I have our supervising school psychologist, Dr. Michael Blanchard. And we are gonna be giving you some updates on some of the initiatives that we held over the summer programs. I know that was a, um, an interest that you wanted to hear about and, and what happened over the summer. We're also gonna give you some um, updates on some things that are gonna be taking place with the new uh, funding that we've received for the grants that we've received. So we wanna give you just a little bit of information. I don't wanna take up too much time, but we're gonna start off with something that was already brought up about what we track to determine um, whether we're being successful in uh, oh, what we're doing with our mental health services that we provide. And I'm gonna let Dr. Blanchard address that, but obviously this has been um, very, uh, a very different few years for us. And so we're starting out with some very skewed numbers and I'm gonna let Dr. Blanchard address the um, the data that you see on the screen right now. So Ms. Ben Lockhart, you brought up a very good question. How are we gonna measure the success or lack of success of all these programs? It's a great question. Why we brought up the concept of skewed data is whenever we're measuring progress, we have to assess where's our baseline? Where are we starting so that we know if it worked or if it didn't work? One of the challenges, and you'll see here in a second, is our data is a little skewed right now, mainly because of the virtual learning students have been in for, in essence, the last year and a half. So if you look at our data here, when we talk about safe screenings, risk assessments, and threat assessments, what a safe screening is, very briefly, is when a student makes a statement that they want to harm themselves, a school counselor will meet with them and ask a, a set of four questions. After they ask those questions, that's what the safe screening is, and Prior to going out in March 2020, the school year 2019-2020, there was 853 of those up through March, I believe, 12th of that year. So usually we, somewhere around over 1,000 a year we do of those, okay? After the safe screen is completed, a school counselor is obligated to consult with a school psychologist to make a determination whether or not a more thorough evaluation needs to be done. That's a risk assessment. And as you can see here, there were 333 of those done up through March uh, of 2020. Now you say, why is 853 versus 333? Because not all statements made by students require a more thorough evaluation. But as you can see here, we do quite a few of those. In addition, we had eight, 182 threat assessments, and a threat assessment is when a student makes a statement to harm someone else. Uh, it could be a staff member, it could be another student, or maybe generalized threats towards the school building, the community, and so on. So as you can see, that keeps us very busy when students are in person. However, as soon as March 2020 hit and all last year, you could see the difference in our numbers. So last year, we only did 63 safe screenings, 33 risk assessments, and three set of threat assessments. So in one, in one hand, you could look at it and say, my goodness, we are doing a fantastic job. Look at the numbers. We have really headed off a lot of issues with students. That's one way to look at it. I think, though, that we're being more realistic in saying that because of the virtual learning, the students were, and parents were not necessarily reaching out to us as much as if they were in person and we would see them on a daily basis and can assess their progress. So now, can you print that page? In addition, one of the other pieces of data we look at is our discipline data. 2019-2020, there were 20,027 referrals. 
Okay, and that's for a whole, the whole spectrum of discipline referrals that we may experience in the school system. All the way from very minor issues all the way up to the major types of issues. That was up through March 2020. After that time, all through end of, la through end of school year last year, we had 433. Again, my goodness, we have headed off a whole lot of issues. Or what was happening is when students were virtual, we weren't obviously experiencing the day-to-day -day kinds of issues that arise when students were in person. So again, the numbers we're entering into this year are gonna look much different than they have in the past. And I think our biggest worry and why we've done so many different, looked at so many different programs is we really need to get a clear handle on where our students are coming back into the building. We're already experiencing some of that with our students and we're gonna to continue to experience that over the next year. Just as of yesterday, I just quickly asked for some updated data on some of these things. And as of yesterday, we've already had 26 safe screenings, nine risk assessments, and two threat assessments. That's just since this, the kids have started back with us. So you can see the uptick already. We were anticipating that our students were gonna be needing some extra supports. And so we have put some things into place which we're hoping will be effective. Obviously, it's gonna take us some time to collect that data. I'd also like to make mention that some of the things that we already have in place were relatively new to us, even including our Move This World or our base um, platforms. They started, this is our third year in, and out of those three years, two of those years, we've been, you know, the, the numbers are skewed, the, the timing is skewed. So we're gonna to have to take a look at that and basically start with some new fresh data. Obvious this, obviously this year, our numbers might be higher than they have been in the past. But again, we are aware of that and we're taking a, a good look at that. We thought of those things when some of these um, supports were put into place, not only for the summer, but for the future. So in the summer this year, we had, um, we had put in place parent clinics, parent guardian support clinics, where we had our staff manning um, the phones and any referrals that parents would like to make in terms of calling in for support. We had 15 parent participants take part in that. And we advertised that. It wasn't as high as what we thought we may get, but we did have some parents who, who called. And it was basically asking for um, support with anything that had to do with school. Um, and, and I think, you know, for 15 for our first year going through this, that was, that was pretty good. Hopefully next year over the summer, we're gonna have the same kind of supports in place for our parents and the community. Um, and then we had our summer small group counseling. And through this, we had about 480 middle school students who participated in daily SEL lessons using a Reallyville curriculum that was through the instructional, um, through the instructional programs that they had for the boost programs. And uh, we had 16 school counselors um, or school psychologists together directly give virtual 50 minute lessons to each of the classes that were held for the boost program. So there were 64 total classes one time per week. So once a week in person, a counselor or a school psychologist actually gave a live lesson for uh, social emotional learning in, um, in their boost classes. Um, we also had, and it's not on here, but all elementary students participated daily in their Move This World social emotional lessons as well. Those never stopped. Those continued throughout the summer. We've also um, are, are piloting a new program. Signs, it's not new, it's new to us. Signs of Suicide in Middle and High School Prevention Programs. We're piloting in three high schools. Um, with a projected rollout in November. We have a universal mental health screener that we're, uh, we're actually looking or taking a look at to see, uh, I guess, several options that uh, Dr. Blanchard and his, his group are, are looking over to see which ones we're going to choose to do that. Um, school psychology testing equipment. Um, and again, the student services staff resource library, I think we mentioned that last time, we are looking at, those funds are released now yes. from when this was done, so we're getting ready to implement all of those things. 
And Dr. Blanchard, I don't know if you want to speak as to any of those. One of the pieces, you know, we're talking about data, the universal mental health screener, and we're looking at several options. Our goal is to also collect some information on where our students currently are. So one of the goals of that is also to collect some generalized data on, you know, our students' perceptions of how they're doing, what their strengths are, what some of their challenges are, that will help us continue to develop some programs to address those issues. Then we still have our base education and our Move This World. Base education is that online SEL program that's focused towards our secondary students. Um, what's different about it this year is that um, all the middle and high school students now have seats available so they can participate. When we initially um, purchased the program, it was only 100 seats per middle or high school. BASE has uh, opened this up for all of our students to be able to have that uh, access to these modules that they can receive training for just a plethora of different uh, of need and support. And we've also trained our school psychologists and our school counselors now on the BASE program so that they are able to, uh, when there's a, a situation with a student, if they feel it necessary to let whoever is going to actually uh, assign the module, tell them exactly what modules would be appropriate for the students to access. And then Move This World, it is currently in all of our classrooms um, in elementary school, K through five, and new for this year, we are adding it to our sixth grade. Again, we thought that it would be beneficial for our sixth grade students, seeing that they, they've had it for the last two years in elementary school, for them to continue with this program as they move into the um, into middle school. So all of our sixth grade will be um, have access to this program in this world. And some other grant initiatives that we're, that we're uh, working on right now, Our Mind Matters, which I think uh, Dr. Gill mentioned earlier in her presentation. It is a student-led club model uh, where teens are trained and empowered to promote uh, school-wide school connectedness and encourage help-seeking behavior and to develop coping skills. So it is youth-led and I think that um, Right now, we're piloting it in two different high schools. One of them is actually up and running. The other one is getting ready. I think they, they have to have a school psychologist and a school counselor and some other staff members involved to train, to help train the students. But um, this is an initiative that I think once we get it out and rolling, that we'll have more high schools join. And then our HERO program. Our HERO program is a mentor, mentoring and leadership building program for students in elementary school. It is um, facilitated by Mr. Keith Elkins. I think you've, you, many of you know Mr. Elkins. We've had it in four of our elementary schools. And this year with the grant funds, we were able to expand it to four more elementary schools. So we're excited about that. Mr. Elkins met with, with the uh, principals last week. We sat down with the new the principals who are going to get the program in their buildings. They're all very excited about it and uh, he's ready to roll. So uh, it's been what the other principals have told me, a godsend to them. He, they have all appreciated having Mr. Elkins work with um, the students and they see great results in the students' behavior and feeling like they're part of a team, bringing down those behavioral infractions that those children have experienced in the past. So it has been quite successful and we're anticipating that these four schools that he's gonna be working with now, these next four schools will have the same results. And then of course our Tri-County Youth Services staff um, at each high school, two days per week, that is also grant funded. We always have them in our elementary and middle schools, but we, uh, it's new that we were able to find the, the funding to get it into our high school. So, but th now that we have the funding for this coming year, that will be continuing um, through 2024. And I think that's about it, if anybody has any. Actually some more. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know where my, my uh, other half of my thing is here. Uh, trauma and behavioral health initiatives. 
parent um, caregiver evening workshops. We have, um, we've already started those, I believe, um, where there are evening sessions for parents. They can sign up, they can um, find out what the topics are and they can sign up for those. Um, motivational speaker funding for all secondary schools. So we know that it's important that the uh, children in, in the schools have um, activities where they can see and hear people that come in and give them uh, some type of message. And that's what these motivational speakers do for a lot of our children through assembly programs. We have um, train the trainer restorative practices training that has been expanded. Mental health first aid expanded for all of our staff. Trauma and de-escalation staff development for non-certificated staff. And that's something new this year. We've always uh, provided that training for our administrators and for our student service staff and some of our special education um, teachers. But this, uh, we actually have already held some sessions with our bus drivers and our cafeteria workers, I believe. So we're gonna continue that as well. Now I think that might be it. Yep, that's it. Any questions? Oh, Mr. Hurd, go ahead. I don't have a question, but I, I did just want to thank you for your work. And uh, this is such an enormous field uh, in the reopening process. And I think we look at the physical logistics of getting bodies in schools, but such a large component of students being back in person is that mental health component. And uh, both of your work is greatly appreciated and much needed. And I also wanted to thank Ms. Lugo, because I know she's done a lot of work, especially on the Our Minds Matters Club. And I've seen even at La Plata, we've been trying to start the club there. And uh, that's a very powerful thing for students to be able to come together and lead the way on solutions to their own problems. And I think uh, really that's a model that hopefully we can replicate and use in the future for other issues as they arise in our school system. So thank you for being a trailblazer. Thank you, Leanne. A uh, couple questions, comments. Um, you mentioned uh, some of the training is online, that it is accessible online. Uh, so the question is going to be, do you, are you tracking who is actually utilizing the service, and are we getting a return of investment? Well, I can, I can speak. Well, this is one example. The trauma and de-escalation staff development took place in August. So we trained food service workers, our full-time IAs, as well as bus drivers and bus attendants. Now, not everyone attended because it was in August. We were trying to do it prior to people returning to work where the students were in the buildings. Um, but we had, I would say, almost 300 attendees. And our goal is because at the state level, they're also requiring trauma training for all staff across the county. And we've worked very hard to ensure that our teachers in our buildings are receiving that in our school administration. But it was important that we also try to reach out to our non-certificated staff. And our goal will be, because um, these are grant funded, um, typically as we do need, we'll have to show some measurables from this as far as you know, things around discipline, attendance, uh, reduction in risk assessment threat, those kinds of things. Okay. So could you give me an example of what moved this world? So if someone is watching, I'm a non-educator, what would be an example in a, in a classroom set, setting that would be move? move this world so in elementary school and this is every morning the students have a move this world probably it could last from five to maybe ten minutes at the most and what the teacher does is basically puts on an interactive presses a button and there's an interactive lesson that takes place with move this world people who put these modules together and these videos together and they may have a lesson about bullying and so they talk about, um, you know, what steps, what they would see if there was a bully, what would they do, how would they react. And they give, they stop the video and they give them a few minutes to maybe write something down or talk to their partner. And then they have a conversation and report out. And they might give them a minute to do that. And then they resume the video. So they have, um, they have emojis that they use, all kinds of different expressions and how they are feeling. So they would always start the day with, you know, 
show your expression or your emoji or what you're feeling so the kids would actually you know ball up their fists or you know and then they would they would teach them okay how would you overcome that feeling what's something that you would do and they would give them suggestions they would give them dialogue they would talk to them about who they could speak to about those things so there's a every day there is some type of a small lesson that's given in terms of managing your emotion and your feeling and how you would address a situation does the principal or the teacher choose is it, it is all scripted so every day it's the same one for grade level one grade level two three and four five so every day it's the same lesson for all those grades but it might be a little bit more advanced for the second grader or the fifth grader okay so if there's a uptick in bullying in a particular school could you modify to say to, to influence the behavior absolutely you can always go back to any of the modules and replay them for your your students but move this world their um, their staff is so responsive if you contacted them they will send you more information and more resources to use with your with your school so they are um, very responsive to any of the times that we have contacted them and one of the accolades that they gave to us is the actual um, creator of move this world contacted me personally last year to let me know that we are the highest usage um, school system for move this world and wanted to congratulate us for our work with the program because um, they can monitor and we can monitor how much we use the program and who's actually using it in each of the schools and all of our elementary schools are on board and our principals have reported to me how wonderful they feel this program is for their students i can remember when we rolled it out uh, we only had one school that was using it, and that was indian head and they were the ones that brought it to my attention um, so when we rolled it out for all of the elementary schools, the principals were a little hesitant because, you know, that's extra time and, you know, it's one more thing and on and on and on. Uh, but once they started using it, they can't say enough about it. They, they really do appreciate the fact that the kids have a consistent social emotional learning program that they're receiving something daily. So rolling it out to the middle schools, um, kind of the same reaction but i think once they start working with it and realize the benefit of it that i would hope that we can even move it further into the middle school not just in sixth grade so i think it is good that you're able to monitor the usage to you know it's a good program this is kind of a a technical question uh i'm just curious how it's done in ct ccp yes i'm kind of looking at miss Ms. Acton, whenever there is a, a contract, um, like you, one of these organizations is providing services, um, a lot of organizations has an individual that oversees that contract. I forget the, the, the terminology. It, do we, so we have some of that in place for some of these contracts? I mean, you know, if you're saying that such and such organization is providing so many hours a week at at the high school level, not only is somebody monitoring that they are showing up, but uh, are they? Or how do we prove that they are, you know, moving moving the needle? Shall we say? I'm not quite sure. Well, how how do we know how how we're measuring success when we subcontract some of the mental health services? You know. Oh, for like Tri County, mm -hmm. or, tri or or any other contracting service. Do you have someone overseeing so how tri, how, Well, I, I could speak to Tri-County maybe as one example. In any of these situations, whether it's base, move this world, Tri-County, when we are subcontracting, we do have people who are managing. For example, Tri-County, we subcontract with them to provide the services, but we have an MOU and we've done RFPs and a, and a three-year contract with them, which we've added on to with the high school. They have their own oversight process. They have someone who coordinates their services. They have someone who's tracking the progress of the clinicians. They have to sign in and out of our buildings on a daily basis. They're required to provide a certain amount of services per week, as well as to carry a certain caseload of students, plus a total amount of students per year. 
plus they also have to provide us because this is grant funded uh, results of their progress as far as who are their work. We can't, the challenge is because it's come confidential, we don't always know all the specific details of what they're working with each student, but they can report back to us they've worked with X amount of students, here's the progress, here's what we're using as measurables to uh, say how this student is progressing as an example. Okay. That's one example and we have it subcontracting with Move This World and Base and other organizations, very similar in that there's platforms that we track progress. We contact them if there's technical issues. They can provide us detailed information about progress, who's using it, who's not, how it's progressing, what students have actually used it, what students haven't, those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Is, is, can I just add, at, at one point, uh, weren't the principals asked to uh, evaluate the service in their building? I knew yes. we, we used to do with Tri-County, so that was an additional point of feedback about whether or not the services were being rendered, number yeah. one, and the, you know, the value of them. Yeah, we did a satisfaction survey. We didn't do it, obviously, during COVID because everything was virtual and the way they did the referral process, they weren't assigned to a school building, it was more generalized. But we did a satisfaction survey. We asked principals, obviously working with their student services staff, you know, did you receive the services that you hoped to receive? Did they work with the students? Were they accessible? Did they come to meetings as you required them to? And for the most part, in just about every case, we received very positive feedback. And when there was an issue, we felt that tri county was on top of that and addressed it with the clinician. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Mr. Hein? Good afternoon. The first part of this presentation, I am joined by Steve Vance, who's to my left, your right. He's our supervisor of maintenance. And then further down to my left is Steve Andritz, who's our director of planning and construction. We have three items uh, which we're here to share with the board and the public today. Uh, the first is the project status update. Uh, that was a document uh, that was uploaded to board docs. And just to uh, Highlight a couple things with project status update. Obviously, you saw a picture of Benjamin Stoddard uh, Middle School earlier. Uh, so that's a continuing project. Uh, it was pointed out by Dr. Jones and Dr. Gill. Uh, so that's a phased occupied renovation. So we are now in occupying that three-story section. And you saw some uh, slides uh, during the August board meeting uh, with, with Benjamin Stoddard. Important for the public and the board to be aware that this, again, is an ongoing uh, project. So now the construction will move into the existing parts of the building where there'll be some demolition of exist existing parts of the building and then some renovation of existing parts of the building. And that loss of space is being offset by the use of relocatable classrooms that are on that campus that once this complete project is complete will go away and we will not have relocatable classrooms on that, on that campus. And also there are punch list items going on in the new story three uh, section uh, of that building. And then the same thing over at Eva Turner, which we uh, had staff and students uh, move back into uh, this fall. Uh, and there are punch list items occurring in that building. What do I mean by punch list items? Uh, things that need to be corrected through construction are ongoing. And those can take uh, you know up to several months to have those punch list items uh, corrected. And then major systemic systems, uh, and, and you know the roof and things have warranty periods uh, that go beyond punch list item corrections. So, Mr. Andritz, anything you'd like to add with project status update? No, not at this moment. For brevity, we'll uh, turn it to you in case you have questions. All right. Our second information item today is a report item, and that's the comprehensive maintenance plan. Uh, more commonly known as the CMP. And this is one of the supporting documents that not only Charles County, but all school systems have to submit in support of their CIP. So later on in the board meeting, we have an action item, which is our actual CIP, the Capital Improvements Program, that you're gonna be voting on uh, so we can submit that to the state in, in, in October. So this is one of the documents that we have to submit in support of that. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Vance again, who is our supervisor of maintenance 
who puts together this document. Important to know that you know, this is a, a prime example of the collaboration that has to go on between planning and construction because it's Steve Andrews and his folks that generate the CIP, but that's based upon information coming from our existing schools and working with Steve Anson, the many folks that Steve works with in identifying issues in our schools, schools that need potential renovations. Uh, and again, that's also goes further with that collaboration, working with our operations staff led by April Murphy and the building service workers in our building because they're there every day seeing these things and identifying these things. So you'll get, as Steve will get into further into this uh, presentation, you know, the use of school dude and our work order system that we have. So at this point, Mr. Vance. Thank you, good afternoon. Hi. The comprehensive maintenance plan outlines how maintenance in our facilities uh, interact together, um, the processes that we take on to accomplish the work that we do. Uh, as Mr. Heim had mentioned, this is a living document that's presented each year to the board for approval, and then we submit it to the IEC with the uh, other two documents, the CMP and the Educational Facilities Master Plan. Um, next year, the um, IEC is working on new guidelines for the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan, and there will be a new format to it. Um, and also, it looks like the timing of it will be uh, in collaboration with the Educational Facilities Master Plan, so we'll be presenting in May, I believe. Um, just a few items to note with the Comprehensive Maintenance Plan. Um, table of contents, the chapters basically outline everything involved with our department, uh, from our organizational chart to the inventory of facilities, the amount of square footage we cover, uh, the various types of maintenance we perform, whether it's preventive, scheduled, reactive, um, a description of the work that we perform in the schools is captured in there. There's some reports in there that show how we're doing the work, gives us a matrix of the performance. Um, also discusses budget as well as environmental and safety. Um, so it is a collaborative effort between maintenance and operations as both uh, everything that's involved in this is handled between the two departments. Uh, just a couple things to note in this year's report, as this is a living document, so the uh, majority of it uh, remains the same. There are some items of change here. Um, you look at, we had completed almost 16,000 work orders this year. Uh, we had a total of 16,500 submitted. Uh, to give you an idea of where we're at with work orders pre-pandemic, we were a little over 18,000. So our numbers are increasing back and we're seeing our activity with the return of uh, full school with uh, August and early September, our, our work order numbers are right where they were pre-pandemic, which that's, you know, you're, we're dealing with more of our reactive maintenance, wear and tear every day, door hardware, uh, fixtures, things like that. So we're seeing that we're, pre, we're getting right back to pre-pandemic levels, so we're excited to see the, uh, that process. Um, there's a breakdown of how our work order, all those work orders, how they evolved. We have almost 200 facility scheduling work orders, which uh, that was nowhere near what we saw pre-pandemic because our buildings weren't being utilized after hours by outside at, um, outside uh, organizations such as community service as much as they were prior. Um, request work orders, uh, we had com completed 12,793, and you can see statistics-wise, we're at 96 and a half completed this year, where previous year we were at 97.2. We've gone down a little bit on there. Um, chapter four, preventative maintenance, explains various methods of maintenance that we use from unplanned to planned. And one thing to note, over the last year, we've kind of since reactive maintenance wasn't what it normally is, we were doing more scheduled or planned maintenance, and we have just wanted to highlight a couple of the projects that we had taken on that we would have had to juggle a little more difficult in regular school times. Uh, items such as the chiller replacement at Mad Woman, uh, cooling tower design and efforts that we have that's ongoing with Thomas Stone High School, heating oil tanks replacements, um, that's something that's ongoing as those are aging infrastructure, and it's items that are beneath the ground or you know, behind the scenes that need to be addressed, and we have to plan for them and address those as we can. 
Uh, we were also to do, able to take on some projects that are seen, such as some gym floor refinishing. We were able to uh, take on Westlake, Davis Middle School, and even Madwoman Middle School with the opportunities that we had. And also we were able to do some flooring, uh, address some flooring issues that we had throughout several school systems. So we were able to take on some large projects that normally were juggling a tighter window and things worked out really well for us. And one of the great things that Mr. Vance and his staff do as part of preventative maintenance, you know, those first two examples, the chiller replacement and the cooling tower replacement, through Steve looking in, in advance and having a plan in place, knowing that you know two or three years down the road, this might need me to be replaced and that might need to be replaced. He has a plan in place and along with trying to juggle that with his, with his budget that he has. But there are many times when we as a school system are able to take care of major systemic replacements uh, through our operating budget that many other school systems uh, have to do it through the CIP. And, and, you know, and we kind of almost do that because we don't always get a lot of money through the CIP for systemic renovation. So we've had two roof projects, uh, the Westlake roof replacement and the uh, Hanson Middle School roof replacement on the CIP for several years. We've received local construction funding. I mean, the county has given us construction funding for it, but we've not received state uh, funding for that. We're op more optimistic this year based upon where they fall in the order on our CIP, which you'll see later uh, in, in the evening. But again, to my point that Stephen and his staff do a great job of being able to take care of some of these major expensive projects that are, you know, three, four hundred dollars, three or four hundred thousand dollars and higher uh, through his operating budget. So, you know, kudos to his staff and making sure that we're identifying replacement issues before they, we have those, those breakdowns. So questions. The only question I had, real quick, when <coughs> that number of the uh, 15,000 work orders, was that from last year? Even though we weren't in school, we still had that many? That was last fiscal year, correct. Wow. Okay. That was June, uh, July 1 to June 30th of this year. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, even schools, we, food service had their program. Um, we worked continuously with them throughout the system, worked with operations on taking care of stuff, technology. So. You know, even though the buildings weren't used at pre-pandemic, it was still and also, going on everywhere. And also part of our preparation for the return of students, we went through, we had teams going through the buildings made up of operations staff and, and maintenance staff, uh, I, trying to identify things. So you know, one of the things that you know, the CDC and the health department was talking about is you need to make sure that all your exhaust fans were, were, were in working order. So in, in kitchens and restrooms and locker rooms. So as we found some of those things weren't operating, then the building service staff would submit a work order. So uh, you know, even though we weren't fully running our buildings, they were still occupied and those major systemic systems were still continuing to, to operate. Okay. I I will th always be an advocate for you guys because, uh, you know, so often as board members, we get to interact with other school districts um, and, and hear about their challenges. And I will tell you, Charles County Public Schools, the preventive maintenance, the proactive approach, the, the planning, the renovation, you know, the assertive, I mean, I, th I think you guys are the best uh, in, in the state in terms of the, the construction and facility management. I, and I sincerely mean that. And I, obviously I'm biased, but, <laughs> uh, but just, just slightly. But the point, point being is people walk into our buildings, um, you know, not everything is perfect, but we're, we're not one of these uh, school facilities that you hear about or read about in the newspaper about crazy things break, breaking down or no air conditioning. And if it did happen, you guys are, no pun in, intended, jiffy on the spot. I mean, you're, you're, you're on it. And so I think it's a tremendous, tremendous amount of pride. Uh, and so thank you for what you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. See? At this point, we're going to shift our focus to the middle school redistricting. So I'm going to be joined by Mr. Brad Snows, our Director of Transportation. So Mr. Snow and Mr. Andrews were the two co-facilitators of the middle school redistricting. And uh, in the middle part of the presentation, then we will ask Dr. Navarro to join us because she will be giving her recommendation 
uh, for the proposal moving forward to, to the board. Uh, so at this point, I turn it over to Mr. Snow and Mr. Andritz. Good afternoon. Um, Benjamin Stoddard Middle School is the driver for one portion of the comprehensive middle school redistricting and balancing overcrowding issues at other schools is the other driver. So we'll start with some facts here on Benjamin Stoddard Middle School. As Mr. Hyam mentioned a little while ago in the uh, project status, Benjamin Stoddard is a phase while occupied renovation that will be completed in the fall of 2022. The contract for construction and renovation is $48,171,000. The square footage of the building is going to increase from 105,800 square feet to 148,317 square feet. The current state rated capacity of the existing building was 711 students and it's proposed to increase to 975. Superintendent's charge for the redistricting committee. The committee is charged with creating two alternatives that will establish new school boundaries. This is a comprehensive middle school redistricting with a focus on redrawing an expanded attendance zone for Benjamin Stoddard, which is receiving a complete renovation and expansion scheduled for completion for the start of school year 22-23. Board policy 1900 establishes procedures for redistricting. Our goal is to move some students among all middle schools with due consideration of state rated capacities or SRCs as you'll see it throughout this presentation and anticipated growth using target enrollments provided by school and county government staffs. The general guidelines for the redistricting committee. All neighborhoods are eligible for redistricting except those currently designated as non-transport or walking zones. Those are the ones that outline the closest proximity to the schools. Whenever possible, neighborhoods should not be divided between different schools. Account for current and future residential development when meeting enrollment targets. Consult with transportation representatives regarding the possible effects to existing bus routes when moving students. And when proposing changes to existing school zones, move students farthest from their current school to another school whose current attendance boundaries border the existing school. timeline it started last October of 2020 when the board members had selected uh, uh, randomly drawn uh, uh, volunteers from the schools and we did have a prior to even the start of the two committees meeting we had a virtual meeting uh, where the public had an opportunity to present their concerns or bring issues to the attention of the committees before they had their first meeting uh, after the committee members were selected during that November board meeting, uh, we did start and the meetings had to be paused due to COVID. Uh, the best format for conducting these meetings are in person. Uh, so they had started the meetings and we had to pause that uh, with the increasing uh, numbers in, in the county at that time. The committees resumed in May and they had two distinct proposals, which uh, in July 20th and August, uh, the two groups presented their proposals to the board. We had three uh, town halls have been held since the August board meeting and, and today in September obviously we were going to have the superintendent's recommendation we will hold two additional hearings one virtual and one in person or, or town halls uh, so again the public will have an opportunity before the board makes their consideration to take action and then we anticipate in October that the board will take action to accept uh, Dr. Navarro's proposal or a modification of that proposal. So as Mr. Heim mentioned, uh, at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, the board randomly selected 11 parents to serve on the committee. You had two elementary school parents, one high school parent, and one middle school parent from each of the eight middle schools. Additionally, three community at large members were selected and four school principals. Important to note that the school principals do not represent the middle schools as we do not want them to have a uh, interest in the proposals that were presented. So we wound up with principals from the elementary, from the high school, and from the uh, alternative school programs. Additionally, we had staff from Charles County Public Schools supporting the committees as they worked, and three local government planners, two of them from Charles County Government Planning and Growth Management Office, and one from the town of La Plata. And is Dr. Mar gets ready to join us with her recommendation and we would again just like to thank the committee members uh, both who are members of the public but also the uh, school system and county government who came out and participated uh, in these meetings uh, which is obviously a very important decision that's going to be made here within the 
the next month. Uh, and it's not always uh, the most popular decisions. These are difficult decisions that have to be made, and there's at times controversy uh, with these recommendations and the ultimate decisions that are made. So again, we, we are you know, greatly uh, indebted to those folks who participated uh, and made these uh, recommendations uh, to, the, to the superintendent. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Navarro. Sure. Thank you. So um, this, e this afternoon, I bring forward to you my recommendation. I just want to talk very briefly about the process. Um, I really do also want to thank the community uh, committee members. Um, when the presentation of both of the alternative plans was given to me, there were um, questions about tweaking small pieces of it. Um, but I think it's important for the, to um, really support the work that these work groups undertook. Um, and so my recommendation moving uh, forward to you is alternative A. And you can see here the basic bullets of why. Um, first and foremost, it's important to make sure that the guidelines set forth by the board in terms of its priorities about making redistricting um, solutions really, really focus on capacity. And so what you see here is plan A has the least amount of student movement and increases in various zones of growth for the county, the most amount of building the, uh, maximizing the utilization of the existing facilities and facilities to, to that are in play. So um, for that specifically, um, you can see that in areas of where we have um, high growth or expected high growth, um, alternative A really puts us in a three and five year rollout at a place where um, the buildings are being maximized to its best capacity as we have it now. As you know, this is a continuous process as the district grows and as you know more um, schools come on board, this is a continuous process. But at this point in time, my recommendation to the board is um, option A, as it stands, as the committee brought it forward. So this next map is the current existing middle school zones, and then the following maps will show you the changes uh, proposed by Proposal A, and Mr. Snow and Mr. Andritz will go through those maps with the board and, and the public. Thank you, Mr. Hahn. Uh, alternative A moves 992 students. These are existing students that are currently registered in, in Charles County Public Schools. Uh, some of them may be in the middle schools already, and some of them may be in elementary that will be attending middle school. Uh, but these are the students that are impacted directly. Next slide, please. Well, so, uh, let me do this for okay. So with what you're gonna see here with, the, I'm sorry, you're right, Brad, it's your, go ahead. So we'll go through um, each of the, the schools that are impacted, uh, the middle school rezoning. Uh, we'll start off by looking at the Davis zone for under, under alternative A. As presented, you'll see uh, movement on the southern side of the zone from Henson and from Madawoman. State rated capacity of 997. The official enrollment was 885. And the two-year growth would be 934. And in school year 25-26, uh, the Davis zone under alternative A would be 950. And I just want to point out with the number you'll see on the left, the 885, we used school year 1920 as our base based upon our enrollment was higher at that time because that was with the September 30th, that was pre-COVID, pre-pandemic. Uh, and obviously with last year, we had less students uh, through the various phases in our building. We had a number of students who were withdrawn for various reasons. So the base enrollment numbers we used for this redistricting process were for school year 1920 and not 2021. Then as you'll see the following two maps, just as we have in every presentation, we've shown you the block outlines. And then also the third map would be the underlay showing you the roadways that are clearly visible um, underneath the blocks in the new school zone for Davis. Next, we have John Hansen Middle School. You'll notice that the new zone is outlined in uh, the dark bold. You have areas in red that are shown moving out to Summers and out to Stoddard and a small area moving in in green from Stoddard. The state rated capacity of John Hansen is 797. The September 30th, 2019 enrollment was 893. The projected enrollment under plan A for school year 22-23 is 805 and for school year 25-26 is 833. 
the second map shows you the zone with the enrollment blocks underneath, and the third map shows you the zone with the road network underlaid. And those blocks are how the group, when they start looking at moving areas, they move them by block number. So a block number might, in some cases, if it's a very dense neighborhood, one neighborhood may be its own block. If it's an area that's more rural, you know, less densely populated, you might have just a number of roads, street addresses that are a part of that, that block. Next is the Henson zone. Under alternative A, you'll see the state rate capacity of 668, the official enrollment. September 30th of 19 was 811. The two year projected growth would be 654 and the five year at 666. You can see that we have been, the committees have brought in blocks from Summers and we'll be removing a block to Davis uh, to create this Henson zone. Again, the second map shows you the block number with the, with the allocated students. And then of course the roadways underneath Henson zone for alternative A. The next school is Madam Woman Middle School. Uh, Madelman had one area that, as you see in red in the upper center, is moving out to Davis. The state rated capacity of, Ma of Madelman is 912. Their September 30, 2019 enrollment was 1,026 students. Under Plan A, their proposed 22-23 school year number will be 915, and their school year 25-26 number will be 943. This is their enrollment zone with the enrollment block shown. And this is their enrollment zone with the road network underlaid. Next is Pickle Waxen. For alternative A, you'll see a number of blocks moved from Summers to Pico. Uh, state rate capacity, SRC, 563. The official enrollment, September 30th of 2019, was 450. The two year growth for 22 23 will be 551 students, and for 25 26, 570 students. Again, you'll see all the blocks that are associated with Pickle Waxen that they've chosen for alternative A, and then the roadway underlay. Next, we have General Smallwood Middle School. You'll see areas along the right-hand side of the map that are moving in to General Smallwood from Milton Summers, shown in green. The state-rated capacity is 604. Their official September 30, 2019 enrollment was 527. Plan A's proposal has them opening in school year 22-23 at 555 and at school year 25-26 at 561. Next, you have the map that shows all the enrollment blocks of the complete zone and the complete zone with the road network underlay. For summers, you'll see a number of blocks that have been moved out to Smallwood, Henson, Pickle Waxen, and Stoddard. You'll also see blocks moved in from Stoddard and from Hanson. Under the state rated capacity of 795, the official enrollment was 1086, September 30th of 19. The two year projection would bring summers to 686 and the five year projection to 860. Followed by the two maps, one with the new uh, zone, with the blocks, and then of course the roadway underlay. The last school zone is Benjamin Stoddart Middle School. Um, as you see, there are areas moving in from Hanson along the left side of the map, and then from the south in from Summers, and you have two areas moving out in red from Summers and, or excuse me, out to Summers and out to Hanson. The state rated capacity is shown as 975 with an asterisk. That's the number that we anticipate the state will approve when we submit the final plan after construction is finished for the state rated capacity. But that is also the target that the redistricting committee used when they established the plan for Stoddard. Uh, the current SRC is 711. Their official September 30, 2019 enrollment was 814. Plan A's proposal at opening of school year 22-23 would have the enrollment at 986 and in school year 25-26 at 1,019 students. And just like to remember the board and the public as we talked about the phased renovation at Stoddard, uh, we talked about demolition. So the early plan for the construction had much more of the building being demolished uh, but as we uh, listened to some concerns uh, by uh, the public and some uh, a former board member, uh, we changed course of action uh, midstream. So we are saving an additional wing or pod at Stoddard, uh, knowing that there is going to be potentially future growth in that area. Uh, so our state rated capacity with the you know completed renovation is 975, but we will have which 
which is, will be, once it's completed, an assembly area, which can be used uh, for six or seven classrooms. So we will have some additional capacity beyond the 975 for future use if needed. And again, as Mr. Heim mentioned, that's for future build out whenever we need. The next map shows you the Stoddard zone with the enrollment blocks underlay and the Stoddard zone with the road network underlay. And before we get to the chart, one other important member of the team that I would like to acknowledge who's been here with, here with us in past uh, presentation is Jen Fitzgerald. She's our routing specialist in transportation. So beyond, as we talked about earlier, all the difficulties with the late registrations and routing buses, uh, she's also been working with us very closely during this entire process in generating uh, these maps and for board, former board or more members have been here part of past redistricting knowing that these maps that we're using are much cleaner and it's because we're using different technology the gis technology uh compared to uh former technology that we have been using so again I'd just like to acknowledge her efforts during this redistricting process the chart that we have here for you uh as we mentioned before enrollment growth was an important part for the committees to consider so as the enrollment blocks were moved, we worked diligently before the process started with the folks from planning and growth management as well as from the town to look at all existing developments that were under construction or planned to be under construction where the students would be generated within a five year window. And those, those numbers were factored into the enrollment blocks. So as the committees were moving students, they were also move, moving those future students. So the numbers that you've seen for school year 22-23 as well as 25-26 do account for that future growth of those subdivisions. This chart shows the middle schools in the column to the left, followed by the state rated capacity of each of the schools, followed by the official September 30, 2019 enrollment, and under Plan A, what the opening would be for school year 22-23 and for school year 25-26. This is again just a quick reference chart so anyone could look straight across one particular school and see how those numbers relate. Resources moving forward, you can find information on redistricting at the website, ccboe.com. Redistricting Middle School, you'll see there on the presentation. And also you can explore the interactive map. The interactive map for both Alternative A and Alternative B have been made available throughout the process. And certainly feel free to email comments at redistrict at ccboe.com. What's up next? As Mr. Heim mentioned, uh, we will be having uh, public hearings in the future. Monday, September 27th, the public hearing from 6.30 to 8.30 will be held at Westlake High School. And we will also have a virtual public hearing from 6 to 8 on Tuesday, September 28th. October, at the board meeting, the board will take action. Uh, redistricting decision will take effect at the start of 2022-2023 school year. And with that, if you have any questions. Mr. Lucas. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Is there a way uh, to see how many students are affected by blocks? So I, I'm looking in the interactive map, and, and I thought maybe it was there. Yes, but it, there is. Okay. Uh, if you go to the interactive maps, there are different layers that you can turn on and off. Right. One of the layers um, gives you the number of students that are in that block. Uh, one is the block number, the other is students in the block. So you'll be able to see that. That does not include the growth. Uh, there we go. Gotcha. But that, that is just the students that exist in the system. That does not account for the growth number. Sure. I mean, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Anyone else? By grade, too. Say that again? That by grade, too, not just total. Yeah, this interactive map Very is nice. hours yeah. of entertainment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can spend Thank a lot of time. Much. Yeah. Anybody else? Mr. Hancock. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the one that sticks out for me is uh, the. it's, it's going to be a pretty hefty increase in, in pickle wax. And, and I, I know the state rated capacity. It, it's for 563 students, but when you walk into that school, it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of room. And to add 100 students next year with the parking limitations that we have and 
with it being an open school, how confident are we that we can handle that, that load there? I would imagine we're pretty confident if we're going to do it, but it's, it's a tough pill to, it's a tough pill to swallow. Um, mainly for the kids that, that are zoned there for that school and that that school is paying a price because of overdevelopment of the northern end of the county. It's, it's going to be tough for the residents in, on that end of the county. To... So as mentioned uh, when we talked a little bit about the Stoddard uh, phased renovation, mentioned that we have relocatables are on site there now. So at the end of construction, those relocatables will go away. So we've already been doing some preliminary planning uh, where we think that they need, may need to be sent. Uh, and ultimately, you know, it's going to be, you know, look, you know, our decision is going to be based upon what plan, uh, you know, the board ends up moving forward with. And if we see that based upon the plan that is accepted, that in five years, PICO is going to be over its state rate of capacity, then that might be one of the schools that may receive a relocatable or, or a duplex, whatever it may be. Additionally, uh, we did have some conversation with um, some folks who were familiar with Pickle Waxen who talked about the times before Davis opened and Pickle Waxen's enrollment was uh, around 530 students at that time. And uh, so a little, bit, a little bit lower than what we're seeing here, but they said it was busy, but it was manageable. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Good afternoon. I'm here to give a report uh, item on 8,000 and 9,000 series policies. Uh, as you may remember, these were reported to the board last March in 2020. And before the board took final action on these policies, uh, we had COVID hit and we put everything on hold. We're now revisiting these policies and we're bringing it back as a report item. I will note that there are three policies that have been changed since 2020, March 2020. Uh, and those changes were as a result of the change in state law in the makeup of the board particularly adding the student member. So policy 9100, 9120, and 9135 do have changes to reflect the fact that we now have a student member who can vote, and that affects, of course, the quorum and, uh, and other voting matters. Um, this is, again, a report item for the board to discuss. If you have any questions, uh, this will be coming back as an action item at the October board meeting. Hearing none, disabled. I'm sorry, I have not, I'll be honest, I have not had a chance to look at the change. Are they noted in the what's posted? Yes. The changes from March of 2020 are not reflected. So uh, what is reflected to the board are changes from current policies into the new language. So uh, the changes that are made from March of 2020 are uh, changing the fact that the student now can vote. That's in 9100. Uh, in 9120, it changes um, the voting of the chairperson that now requires five votes rather than four for the election of the chair and vice chair. And then 9135 uh, reflects the fact that uh, the quorum of the board, um, I'm sorry, reflects that uh, the fact that there are a change in the number of votes that are needed to pass a motion for matters where the student can vote, it's going to be five votes necessary. In matters where the student cannot vote, only four votes will be necessary to pass a motion. But those changes are not noted in what's posted on board docs. The changes from March of 2020 are not reflected to this, but the changes from current policy to this are reflected. I want the public to be able to see what we're voting on. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, like, it's, it's, it is, it is noted here. Yeah, okay. if I could, I think it is on, on board. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, okay. It is. It, it. The changes in total. Correct. Captured, just not the changes from what we discussed before to now are not 
distinctly brought out, but I think that's what Mr. Schwartz was saying. But everything you just said about taking five votes and everything, everything involving having a student board member is shown. Mm -hmm. Questions? Uh, you have a question? Okay. It was just, a, I do have a question on 9338.5. And it's the tape in the Board of Education meetings. So. Ninety three thirty eight point five. Yeah, okay. the very last line says the recording shall be kept for a period of. The four, four? is crossed out. It's five years. So be what five is years. it? It's five, it should be just five. Correct. The four actually has a cross out. It's hard to see because oh, four has, has a. Has a oh, okay. <laughs> I don't. I couldn't see it. Yeah, it's hard to see it in the. Looks like a part of the four. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Well, thank you. That cleared that question up for me. Um, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I have one more. And in, in light of the what we just went through with COVID and having to do video virtual meetings, I forget what number it's under, but do we need to change any of the wording to accommodate that if anything happens in the future? I remember it was previously where we could not vote virtually or a board member could not participate in the vote if they phoned in virtually. It's, it's in here somewhere. Because <laughs> I remember I asked you about it right. two years ago and we voted not to allow a vote if they virtualed in. As long as, uh, as, long as the board member can participate in the interaction with the other board members in real time and can be viewed by the public, that board member can be counted as present. So if we have a hybrid meeting where some board members are in person and some are virtual, those virtual board members can participate in the meeting as long as the public can view them participating and then there's a real time interaction between all of the board members in real time. Okay, but all? in here, I forget, like I said, I forget which one it's in. And since we weren't voting tonight, I did not make this a priority. I apologize. Sure. But in he, it states that they could not vote. So if you could just review that before the next meeting sure. and provide any. Do you have the board the policy number by any chance or your. No, oh, that's why I'm saying okay. I'm scrolling through. I'll make sure I can't find it right now. It. And since we're not voting tonight, that's fine. I just want to make sure that the words are in there that sure. we need. I think it's 9333. Okay. Yes, yeah. 9333. Correct. I think the That's word correct. in there solves it. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. The next item is a report item on the board's goals. These were board's uh, goals that were discussed at the retreat um, and uh, revised from the current uh, board goals. They're posted on board docs. Uh, this is for the board's discussion and action at the October board meeting. If the board has any questions or wants to discuss the wording of the, way, uh, the goals, the wording is uh, based on the discussions that occurred at the retreat uh, we held recently at the College of Southern Maryland. Comments? Questions? I have. Ms. Mrs. McGraw? Okay, I have uh, pretty much what I, what <clears throat> is captured here is what I had in my notes, except for number one. I, somehow, I, I don't recall our extending it to be so wordy. Um, hmm. I would just like for us to, to revisit number one because I'm, I'm not sure that's the way we left it at the retreat. I, 
it, I, I tend to agree with Ms. McGraw. <laughs> Ms. McGraw, what did you have in your notes? Do you, do you have your notes with you? Well, this was just our group. Right. But as I remember, the consensus was. Is it right, Terry? Yes. Um, increase student excuse me. Increase student achievement by offering a continuum of learning opportunities by utilizing the integration of best practices in technology and instruction. I don't know where the collaboration came from. Just a thought. Is there a consensus? Can you read that statement again, Mrs. McGraw? Increase student achievement by offering a continuum of learning opportunities by utilizing the integration of best practices in technology and instruction. Mr. Hancock? So the only thing that's, well, not the only thing, but the biggest thing that stands out to me versus what's on here compared to what Ms. McGraw has is uh, virtual learning is is in this and do we mm -hmm. want it do we want to keep that in there remove it I think uh, I don't know if you go either way technology kind of covers that but we are in a, a new world now where virtual learning is at the forefront well I was ahead, I'm done. thank you I was just going to su suggest that, um, by the integration of best practices and in technology and instruction and expansion of virtual learning opportunities. I, I do think, I agree. I think that should be our focus going forward as well. I agree with the additional wording. Okay, Mrs. Battle Lockhart. Uh, we uh, are recall us singing those words. <laughs> right. um, Can, and, and we talked about technology because of virtual learning virtual learning to be more specific. Okay. Mrs. McGraw, so it's so that it's clear. Could you read that sentence for the minutes? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Increase student achievement by offering a continuum of learning opportunities by utilizing the integration of best practices in technology and instruction and expansion of virtual learning. It seems like it needs another word. <laughs> expansion of virtual learning programs are opportunities. So we got opportunities of learning. It says a continuum of learning opportunities. Programs? Oh. Okay. Is there a consens consensus? with the recommendation, with the sentence that just was read by Mrs. McGraw. Thumbs, thumbs up or th thumbs down. There is a consensus for number one. Okay. Any other comments? Everybody okay with number two? Provide a safe, orderly, and caring environment for students and staff and improve their engagement by supporting mental wellness. Ms. Abel. I think everyone was in consensus with the remaining ones. That was the only one that had different wording. Mm -hmm. Okay, so number two, number three, the, the four, five, and six, and seven. To my knowledge. Thumbs up. Okay. So this will be brought back uh, to the board at the October board meeting for final action. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was okay. Any un. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Any unfinished business? Okay. No. Any new business? No new business. Any future agenda items? We have one item of new business. policies. I wasn't quick enough. I'm sorry. Oh. 
This is a recommendational continuation of suspension of board policies. Again, we only have one policy we're continually suspending. That's the policy 6431 on uh, extracurricular activity and, and sports uh, eligibility. And this is, again, a continuation of the policy we've been suspending since last spring. We need a motion to well, approve you, that. You need a motion? Oh. Yes. Ms. Abel? Now that we're back in the school, why are we continuing the suspension? Uh, we're currently in the first quarter, so we are making sure that students remain eligible through the first quarter uh, based on their um, this policy suspension. We allowed students to remain eligible even if they had not met the original policy of eligibility from last spring into the fall, and we're still in the fall season right now. When does the second quarter start? October. Coming up. So our board meeting isn't until after that, and I would not want to continue this into the second quarter. Is the no. Oh, November. Okay. <laughs> November 3rd, sorry. One more board meeting for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, is there a motion? So moved. A motion made by Miss Mrs. McGraw. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Hurd. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Six, uh, seven uh, uh, in favor, one opposed. Ms. Abel. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Future agenda items. I have two. Yeah. <laughs> I have two, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Butler. Battle wash. <laughs> Taj. <laughs> <laughs> earlier <laughs> brought up the explanation uh, explanation of continuity of the, of the continuity plan and, and a report on proximity mm -hmm. learning okay anybody else mr. Hurd I think at some point it would be useful to have a presentation on athletics and extracurriculars especially as it relates to uh, out-of-county field trips just the state of everything with COVID. Consensus. Is there a, a consensus for the board? Um, Everybody's so nodding their head. What's the first part of that in reference to? I, I get the out of county field trips, but what, it, what are you looking for as far as athletics? Just a presentation on sports as they are, testing, mitigation protocols, uh, okay. leagues. Is there a consensus? Sure. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. It, it might be something. Um, have we had a presentation on already yet? Yeah, it's coming. It's okay. going to be for us to come to you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, anything else? Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, seeing anything else, we should be going on break. <laughs> nice catching up. Welcome everybody back. Um, we have one, uh, before we start the public forum, we have one minor, uh, one minor um, uh, agenda item um, to take care of for the sake of, of having someone receive a proclamation. We, we would like, uh, I would entertain a motion to accept September 15th through October 15th as the Hispanic Heritage Month. Is there, and with the understanding that at the end of this meeting, there are other uh, resolutions that 
as a, as a group that we are going to approve, but for administrative purposes so that we have someone representative of the Hispanic community here, it actually starts tomorrow and we wanted to make sure that we, we kick off the celebration appropriately. So with that said, I will entertain a motion to accept September 15th through October 15th as Hispanic Heritage Month. So moved. Moved by Mr. Lucas. Second. Second by Ms. Brown. All in favor? One, two, three. Motion carried. Oh, uh, oppose? Any oppose? Any uh, abstain? One abstain. Ms. A Ms. Abel? Motion carries. At this time, I will ask uh, Mrs. McGraw to read the. To come forward. Yeah, we're, oh. and ex we'll read it and then we'll call them okay. forward. Resolute, <coughs> excuse me. Resolution: Board of Education of Charles County Hispanic Heritage Month, September the fifteenth through October the fifteenth, twenty twenty-one. Whereas Hispanic Heritage Month began as Hispanic Heritage Week in nineteen sixty-eight and in 1988 was expanded by President Ronald Reagan to cover a 30-day period. It was enacted into law on August the 17th, 1988. And whereas September the 15th through October the 15th has been designated as Hispanic Heritage Month in the United States, and the theme for the year 2021 is Esperanza, a celebration of Hispanic heritage and hope. Whereas the Board of Education recognizes the contributions of our Hispanic students and their families through the history of a rich culture that enhances the experiences for all students. And whereas all educators will engage students in activities and projects that will broaden their perspectives of the contributions of our Hispanic community. And whereas the Board of Education of Charles County recognizes the outstanding contributions made by Hispanic and Latino Americans and celebrate their heritage and culture. And be it further resolved that the Board of Education of Charles County endorses the recognition of September the 15th through October the 15th, 2021 as Hispanic Heritage Month. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be inserted in the minutes of the September 14th, 2021 board meeting. By order of the Board of Education of Charles County, this 14th day of September, 2021, signed Maria, excuse me, Maria Navarro, Superintendent of Schools, and Latina Wilson, Chairperson. So. If Rachel Reyes and Stephanie Larson could come forward to accept. Now ready for public forum. I'll read the rules for public forum. Speakers should identify themselves. Statements should be brief to the point and limited to three minutes or less. Board members should not be expected to respond during the forum to statements made by speakers. Statements should relate to Charles County Board of Education agenda items or any education related topic with the following limitations. Personnel matters, pending or potential appeals, or the comments regarding the actions or statements of individual staff or the private lives of any individual are not appropriate topics. Proper language and decorum are required at all times. Our first speaker this evening is in person, Damian Mayo. Our next speaker is Duran Tross. I'll 
skip over Mr. Charles and come back. Uh, the next speaker is Daughtery Butler Washington. Our next speaker is Emma French. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Emma French, and I'm a senior at La Plata High School. Um, I would like to address the homecoming cancellation for Charles County Public Schools. I made this petition five days ago, so these were the statistics then. Approximately 8,500 high school students have returned to Charles County Public Schools this year. Since the beginning of this 2021-2022 school year, using La Plata High School as an example, only 13 out of approximately 1,100 students have tested positive for COVID-19. That comes out to a mere 0.01% of students. With these numbers, I think we can all agree that hosting an event like Homecoming would be at a reduced risk. CCPS has been doing a thorough job of trying to prevent the virus from spreading as much as possible. They have strongly suggested those who are eligible to obtain the COVID-19 vaccination. They require the uses of masks. They encourage good hand washing and hygiene. They direct traffic in the halls and they enforce weekly athlete testing among other, other preventative measures. We want to have homecoming this year. We would like to bring people together in a community setting to get back a sense of normalcy. We want to have a positive experience with meaningful memories. Everyone can agree that we wanted to return to the building as soon as possible to get some face-to-face -face contact back and human interaction. Everyone felt at a loss of connection when everything was digital last year, and this year has brought us a sense of hope. Events bring people together and build school spirit. We are asking you to stand for change. With respect, I'd like to read you some of the remarks from the signers of this petition I have made. In the past five days, there have been 724 signatures with a mix of students and parents. A male student noted, every other county gets to have a hoco and prom except us. We get to go to school, but we can't have a dance. Another female student wrote, I put in work every day at school around 1,000 kids unmasked with half the school in the lunchroom. There is absolutely no reason why we can't have a dance, pep rally, or parade. A parent said, I believe people should have a choice. All these concerts and fairs haven't been canceled, so why should homecoming be canceled? As long as everyone wears a mask, then what's the harm in trying to let the kids have some fun? It could even be outdoors for all these kids care. They can't get these major life events back. As adults, we say it doesn't matter, it's not important, but I know you as a child would have cared also. A male student said, I'm signing because I believe if we are allowed to sit next to each other at lunch and stand shoulder to shoulder next to each other with no masks at a football game, we should be able to have a dance. I'll wear a mask if we have to and do it outside. COVID is a serious matter without a doubt. As a community, we grieve the loss of life. But there are effective meditation efforts in place to allow for an event outside safer than even attending a typical school day. Attending homecoming is a choice and a choice that we can make both safe and memorable. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Rihanna Alexander. Hello, my name is Rihanna Alexander and I'm a parent and a Charles County employee. When the school year started, I was scared because my daughters were entering kindergarten and the county's positivity rates were steadily increasing daily. Scared because I'd be in a schoolhouse and I'd be the only vaccinated person in my classroom. I chuckled at the thought of 100% in-person learning. Why might you ask? Because I thought that the class, because I know that the classrooms are not built to support social distancing. I know that children are walking germ magnets. I know that they don't wash their hands correctly. I know that parents treat the schoolhouse as free daycare. Children come to school sick on a daily basis and their parents hope that they stay under the radar. I see children come to school with masks that are too big or too small. I witness children at recess playing with their friends in close proximity, hoping for a sense of normalcy, but their masks are down and off their face for over 25 minutes. How do you contact trace that? I see teachers scrambling to properly disinfect between classes, but there isn't enough time built within the schedule. I see what the average parent doesn't see and I'm scared. I'm scared that one day, one of my scholars is gonna test positive and now I have to risk my five-year-olds getting sick. I'm afraid that one day, someone in their classroom is gonna to come to school and I'm going to have to exhaust my leave because the three of us now have to stay home. When I exhaust my leave, how will I receive a paycheck when my leave is up and I have to put in leave without pay? All of this uncertainty prompts me to ask, why not go hybrid? Go back to A-B days. It was a pain for teachers, but it was definitely safer. 
I should not have to risk the health and safety of myself and my family because people who do not sit in a classroom with unvaccinated second graders get to make the rules. The reality is there are no safeguards put in place to effectively and efficiently prevent parents from sending their scholars to school sick. Every day, a new COVID positivity letter is being sent home. For the first time ever, think about the people on the front line. Think about the stress we endure. Every sneeze, cough, and vomit we come in contact with could be the day we're exposed. For once, think about us. Our next speaker is Jennifer Scott. Our next speaker is Melissa Carpenter. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Carpenter. I am a Charles County, lifelong Charles County resident, a graduate of CCPS, as well as a teacher here. I'm once again here to share from the perspective of a teacher. I come to you today exhausted. I honestly didn't think I was going to make it. I am spending entirely far too many nights trying to figure out this new curriculum on top of another long night I know I'll be experiencing tonight. I also had something completely different written. And then I heard that speakers were being asked to leave once they finished speaking. I had planned to come in and speak about the overwhelming workload increase this year from last year. And this year without Wednesdays to plan with teams, catch up with parents, really dive into creating engaging lessons, catching up with all the extra requirements, especially this year with the even more extra requirements, checking both email systems, Synergy and Outlook, uh, and so much more. I had planned to talk about the loss of autonomy for teachers in the classroom, being treated as facilitators rather than educators. I mean, why pay for our master's degrees if we're not gonna be treated like the education professionals we are? I had other plans, but then I remembered my classroom with wall-to-wall -wall desks, spreading my students out as close to three feet as I can. I thought about how difficult it is for my students to move around the room, especially for man mandated guided reading in math groups. How they are by default stuck in their seats most of the day. I thought about how I struggled to move around the room and help students. Most of my kids in the middle of my room do not see me at their desk. I can tell you the huge difference between the rooms that have 15 students in my room with only 23. I cannot imagine my colleagues who have 28 or more in their classrooms. And there is no limit on how many students can be added. Yet 10 extra people is too many for this room and speakers are supposed to exit after comments. I've loved having kids back in school. I have loved working with them in person. I forgot how quickly and easily it was to gather information about students from simple observations. We had fun getting, we have had fun getting to know each other. I'm just asking that the same consideration for spacing that was made for this room be used for our classrooms, especially since our audience cannot yet get vaccinated. As I've said before, I hope this starts the conversation with teachers and not about us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Irene Wheatley. Our next speaker is Will Lewis. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Navarro. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak this, this evening. My name is Will Lewis, and I'm a teacher at St. Charles High School. I first want to thank the board for all that you've done to keep all of our members of the CCPS community safe during this pandemic. Your thoughtfulness and your adherence to science during this pandemic has been commendable. When staff returned to our buildings a few weeks ago, our principals did an amazing job of telling us all of the great things that we did last school year. And they ended by telling us that we matter their staff matters. Sadly, at least in St. Charles, this was followed by a presentation on the Board of Education's COVID leave policy, which there isn't one. Spoiler alert. I know there are no perfect solutions, but we can do better. CCPS received nearly $48 million from the federal government to support us in operations around COVID-19. Sadly, none of that money has been allocated to staff 
and COVID leave. Not one cent. We are on the front lines of this COVID pandemic, dealing with it every single day. Yes, we have a mask mandate, but our kids are kids. They forget. They have to be redirected. They have to be retaught. Kids eat in my room during second chance breakfast. Our staff are monitoring lunches. We're at risk every day in the school building, just like the kids are. This policy is not in line with the previous values of the Board of Education that you've made around COVID. We need action now. I know vaccinated staff don't have to quarantine, but this ignores that breakthrough infections are happening with COVID. Recently, four members <coughs> of Governor Hogan's staff, all fully vaccinated, tested positive for COVID-19 and had to quarantine. Educators are vulnerable to COVID-19. We've also been told that if we feel ill to stay home, as some of you on the board are educators probably remember, educators feel ill most of the winter, <laughs> the fall, the spring. We don't ever feel truly great, but I've been told to stay home if I wake up and I don't feel particularly ill, particularly well, I'm sorry. Last school year, our staff filled thousands of COVID vaccine appointments at the Regency Furniture Stadium because we wanted to do our part to get Charles County Public Schools reopened for students. We did our part. This Board of Education needs to do theirs. In addition to that, our staff are having to use their leave because their kids are put on COVID quarantines or they're having daycare issues around COVID. An early career educator told me recently, Will, I began the school year with 12 sick days. I've already used four because of daycare issues around COVID. What am I gonna do? Staff members cannot afford to take leave without pay during a lingering pandemic. And many of us don't have family here locally who we can lean on. I'm hum I humbly ask this Board of Education to do the right thing and direct Dr. Navarro to create and implement a COVID leave policy for staff. I know this Board of Education cares about all stakeholders in Charles County Public Schools because you've proven it before. When Mr. Conley got up at our staff meeting and he told us that we mattered, I knew with every fiber of his being he meant it. And we were ready to run through a wall. And then they told us about the COVID leave policy. So what I want you to do is to show us how much you care about staff and implement a COVID leave policy. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deron Cross. Thank you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to address the board. Um, I'm often critical and I have a lot, you know, I, I just have to want to say thank you to uh, Jason Stoddard and the staff who earlier uh, with their presentation, I did watch it online. Uh, I think they did a great job and uh, they need to be commended, all of them, uh, for trying to keep us safe. And also to the teachers that are on the front line, thank you uh, as well. Unlike um, most, I've studied the board budget and I know that there's a surplus. Some will not admit it, some will. There's a $20 million surplus. This week, it was brought to my attention that uh, teachers are purchasing reusable water bottles and that many of the students often forget their bottles at home or don't have one. A few teachers have actually reached out to me in the business community and asked us to donate reusable water bottles. That is a shameful act, especially when there's $20 million of taxpayers' surplus funds. Lastly, I would like to address the lack of security at the Thomas Stone versus St. Charles High School football game last Friday, September the 10th. Although there was a minor disturbance, Ms. Pearl, staff, and adults seated near, there was a minor hiccup. They did an excellent job of diffusing the situation. The board has an MOU of agreement with the uh, of RSOs with the Charles County Sheriff's Office, who, by the way, has a hundred million dollar bonus which takes up 22.4% of the county's budget. CCBOE budget is $250 million, which is 48% of that same budget, which brings it to 70.4% of the county's budget, our tax dollars. The citizens and students who attend after our events deserve better, and hopefully the next MOU or the current agreement can be updated. I'm a current board member of the Washington District football officials, and I'm a college football official, but I'm not here speaking on that behalf. However, Prince George County, Calvert, St. Mary's, DCPS, Howard, Montgomery, 
on sporting events or after hour events, you can't start the event without security. And it's a shame that I had six of my officials on that field was in a bowl. Not only there's kids in the stands, anything could happen. Charles kind of was lucky that night. We were lucky. It was a nightmare trying to get out of there. But Ms. Pearl and staff, they did a hell of a job. However, we need to look at this. We need to look at this. Uh, after our events, sporting events, they deserve security. Thank you. I believe Ms. Uh, Butler Washington is here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dottery Butler Washington. I was in front of you in February stressing the need to continue virtual school for all students last year. First, I would like to say I am not against anyone wanting to send their students back to school, but I want the school board to extend the same gratitude to parents who want to have their students continue virtual school. You must admit there have been many issues ensuring our students' safety in the school. Virtual schools have not, have, have not had enough students approved to go to the program. Transportation shortages, teacher shortages, homeschool staff overwhelmed, students getting COVID and one teacher dying from COVID. Part of the school board duties is to research various ways to ensure the safety of our students. We understand COVID was new to everyone. And one of your primary job is to use outside consultants speaking to your neighboring counties to see what they propose for their students. The hiring of buses should have been wider search for county to county with incentives for the bus drivers. The most scariest thing a parent can experience is having their child lost by the school for a period of time. Not hiring the required number of teachers needed to educate our students. Homeschool staff is overwhelmed because of the number of students that has requested to be homeschooled. No directions from the homeschool staff to ensure these students are learning. I understand that the Maryland State Board of Education do not require you to provide a learning package on what is expected, but Charles County should take the initiative to create one because eventually the students will return to you in-person learning and the burden will be on the teachers to ensure the students succeed throughout the school. The record numbers of COVID cases are alarming and to add the teacher dying from COVID I have always stated that COVID decision was never a school decision, but a community uh, decision to send students back to school. The best school works best by allowing input from parents, students, and community. We know that virus school is not the best learning environment for all students. We also know that it's a negative impact or overlaying affecting our most at-risk students. But putting children back in an unsafe classroom with the risk of further destruction from the COVID-19 outbreak will not expedite the closing of our achievement gap. Lastly, I commend your decision last year to keep our schools closed to protect the health and safety of students, educators, and their families. We are not ready to turn the corner on this pandemic. The community is behind you. You, invite, you need to invite them to the table to solve the problem. It is nothing wrong with returning to virtual school for all parents who want to enroll in the program without stipulation placed on their students. We must take the time to ensure that the board decide going forth is a well thought out process to reopen schools safely, rectify teachers and transportation shortages, and address a plan to improve homeschooling for parents and students. This is the only way to rebuild trust between parents, school, and our community. Thank you. I just wanted to double check. I think some people came in late. Damian Mayo, Jennifer Scott, Irene Wheatley. That's it for in person uh, virtual. Uh, I'm, uh, we're going to go to virtual uh, uh, speakers now. Our first virtual speaker this evening is Ms. Brenda Dozier. Ms. Dozier, please come and Is it off? Okay. Yes. Um, my concern is um, my granddaughter. And um, I just wanted to know if <clears throat> in the event that she is sent home, 
with COVID symptoms, will she have the uh, option to go back to virtual learning opposed to having to go back to school to face the same situation again? Yes, and uh, you know, I just wanted to say every single day, because um, I have health issues and I am compromised. I face um, anxiety, I face stress, and you know, not knowing if she's going to come back home sick, and it, you know, it weighs on me each and every day. And um, you know, I'm just confused as to why the children were rushed back into in-person learning before the vaccination was approved for them. Because right now, they the only defense mechanism they have is the mask. And they can, that still does not keep them from getting the virus. It's not 100% uh, safe. So that, uh, that was my uh, main concern. You're welcome. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Apologize for the child screaming in the background. I have three. He will keep crying, but he is safe. Um, let me start off by saying that we're not going back to normal. And the same energy that we have right now of only allowing 45 parent, four to five parents in the building for public forum is the same energy we should be having about kids back in school. Throughout this pandemic, all of our families continue to hear from CCPS is be gracious and give us time. But we're not going to be doing that if you guys aren't going to be working with us. Dr. Navarro's email last week and today's report out from what I've been hearing has excluded the lived experiences of our families and is completely out of touch with our pain and frustration, to be completely honest. Board members asked about homecoming. While cases are surging, an educator has died due to COVID, which one of your staff members tweeted out yesterday. Kids are being lost and forgotten on buses. Our virtual learning program, K-8, is of low quality. Data is not timely, accurate, or disaggregated. And CCPS continues to not engage with families, we need to get it together. Our system needs to do better. And to say that we don't have a clue about anything that you all are doing or not doing is also disrespectful to the board member who said that earlier. The pandemic has shined a bright light on the importance of families. And to be clear right now, we are not working together. I don't know what reality you all live in to say that we are working together, but we definitely have to. This is from the Maryland State Department of Education, ARP ESSER plan that states LEAs and Title I schools are supposed to conduct outreach to parents and family members. And the last thing we want is for MSD to come and take away funds because they're not being properly used. So we do need to work together and we're gonna disagree sometimes, but we need to come together to re-engage families, rebuild community trust, and build long-term collaboration. And we also need transparency, not just in the COVID data, which yes, we need to segregate it, Jason, but we also need to be transparent on how the community is using ARP ESSER funds for phase three. And I wanna know the results of how the 13.7 million for phase two were used as well, because I don't trust any of this. I also want to touch on virtual learning because we did touch upon that today and you know, how we have been talking about the report out. You wonder, and Dr. Navarro, you were happy that parents haven't chosen to enroll in the virtual program. Let me shed a little white light white, okay? Because multiple parents have reported that families didn't get into the virtual program. The plan wasn't told to them until August 30th, which is the first day of school. And as a parent, you know that is little to no communication at the start. Okay, and students that are in new grades, new school with different attainment levels of education are being taught asynchronous and the, the program is a low quality. So you discourage families to enroll in this program, Dr. Navarro. You did and the board did. So congratulations as to why parents are not wanting to take your program and are having to homeschool because they've been abandoned by CCPS. But we can make it better. We need to make sure this is not chaotic. So I do encourage the district to work with families, to work with our school leaders, to work with our neighbors and adopt some of these best practices for virtual learning that is of high quality because we are deserving of innovation and forward thinking. We are not deserving a raffle lottery program that is of low quality and no protection for our our students and our staff and our school community. So I hope you all take this very seriously. What I'm hearing today was just, it's just
just disturbing. Okay, I'm disappointed. I'm definitely disappointed. So I hope you guys do better. You will hear from other parent leaders today on the call on all the other topics and buckets you have all been talking about and clearly are out of touch with reality on what we are actually doing. Thank you. Test, test. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Sylvia Acevedo, Title I Parent Liaison and CCPS Spanish Interpreter at Jennifer Elementary. I'm here to talk about school bus safety. After a year and a half, the start of a new in-person school year is upon us and the sounds of changes in transportation patterns are once again part of our lives, namely the running of our school buses. The full fleet of school buses is operational all across the DC region. According to the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration, students are about 70 times more likely to get to school safely when taking a bus instead of traveling by car. That's because school buses are the most regulated vehicles on the road. They're designed to be safer than passenger vehicles in preventing crashes and injuries, and in every state, stop arm laws protect children from other motorists as a parent liaison i'm in my car traveling around the county and i've observed some horrific practices by motorists towards school buses many pedestrian accidents occur when the flashing signal light system is not obeyed school bus drivers use this system to alert motorists of pending actions as a reminder yellow flashing lights indicate the bus is preparing to stop to load or unload children. Motorists should sh slow down and prepare to stop their vehicles. Red flashing lights and extended stop arms indicate the bus has stopped and children are getting on or off. Motorists must stop their cars and wait until the red lights stop flashing, the extended stop arms is withdrawn and the bus begins moving before they can start driving again. Remind your child that the bus stop is not a place to run or play. When the school bus arrives, your child should wait until the bus comes to a complete stop. And now, Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Schwartz, in this, in this last minute of my time, I will express these sentiments in Spanish for our Hispanic and Latino families, a group with a high rate of pedestrian accidents region-wide. El año escolar ha comenzado y los estudiantes están atendiendo clases en persona. Los sonidos de los cambios en los patrones de transporte han vuelto a ser parte de nuestras vidas. Según el Departamento de Transportación, los estudiantes tienen aproximadamente 70 veces más probabilidades de llegar a la escuela de manera segura cuando toman un autobús escolar en lugar de viajar en automóvil. Eso es dado a que los autobuses escolares son los vehículos más regulados en la carretera. Como recordatorio, las luces amarillas intermitentes indican que el autobús se está preparando para cargar o descargar niños. Las luces rojas intermitentes y los brazos de parada extendidos indican que el autobús se ha detenido y que los niños se están subiendo o bajando. We must promote safety behaviors and tra traffic safety rules on the roads and motorists must follow them. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. My name is Zachary Montanaro. I'm actually one of the primary care providers on uh, the Naval Station uh, base in Indian Head. Um, so I want to bring up the, the my concern as far as what is our cutoff point for uh, with increasing cases, increase in death rates. We hear that that uh, teachers are getting infected and dying, unfortunately. Um, at what point in time, where are we going to draw the line in the stand uh, to offer distance learning back to the children, to the families that, that want to elect to go that route? Um, I don't want to begin to impose on any uh, anyone else and say, hey, everyone needs to do this, everyone has to do this, but it should be offered. Um, and I know the immediate counter is, hey, we offered it. Um, offered a small chunk, a, a pathetic small chunk. Um, we did apply. I have two children in school. We applied. They both had outstanding grades. They have the environment at, at home to, to work with the distance learning. They've been doing it from the beginning because my job. We tried to take the right steps. We isolated our family because my job is frontline treatment. I have been seeing and treating COVID positive patients since the beginning. Uh, so my family bit the bullet and said, we're going we're gonna to hunker down for this. 
when we got here, they turned around and said, nope, you're going to go back to in-person learning this year. We just, just moved here last year. Um, the, so then we reached out to the school because they didn't get selected. With their good grades uh, and their, their, their willingness for that environment, they didn't get selected for the program. It happens. When we reached out to the school and then uh, up to the county to say, what is the protocol? If I come home with a runny nose, which very well could be nothing, um, but due to the high rate, the response I got was when you test positive for COVID. That's not acceptable. For, for all the parents out there, um, I hope you know that as it stands right now, my child could catch COVID, go into the school, and two to five days after catching it, start having symptoms. By that point in time, they've already spread it to all the children in their classroom. And, and our current protocol is, is, is a joke, it's comedic. Um, so I think that the board and everyone else needs to take serious consideration. This is not an isolated thought process. You're hearing it from everyone else. Um, reconsider the distance learning, open it up to families it works for. It doesn't need to go for everyone, but whoever elects to do it, give them that opportunity. Um, don't make that decision for them. That's all I got. I'm sorry, I won't be able to um, to comment at the time. I apologize. <laughs> Um, no, no, thank you. Can everyone hear me? All right. Um, Dr. Navarro and our board are cl clearly out of touch with reality. On September 3rd, Dr. Navarro sent out an email to parents and guardians, and in that me email, the following was stated. I do recognize the need to provide alternative learning options for students and their families. The CCPS home and hospital office is working with families who have students that have medical needs to offer instruction outside of the school buildings. Staff in our homeschool program continue to support families and provide curriculums resources for students. Staff remain committed to ensuring learning continues for all children in Charles County and not just for those in our building. Let's break down the disconnect. The homeschooling department was not supported nor set up to accept the extraordinary amount of families that were left with no choice but to homeschool this back to school season. Homeschooling families, whether seasoned or not, have no support from CCPS. We have asked for and been denied curriculum, grade aligned standards, access to funding programs and resources CCPS has at access to. Historically, some school homeschoolers have been hesitant to take their district up on these free services. However, a lot of parents, including myself, and due to COVID, have decided to homeschool this upcoming year. We need resources. We are still a part of the school community, and our kids will eventually return to CCPS, and they may face a range of learning, laws, and attainment that CCPS will be legally responsible to accelerate. This year is very different for many parents that choose to homeschool, myself included, because once Quinn is vaccinated, he will be returning. If virtual learning is not going to improve, then CCPS needs to engage and be more attentive to, to families that are turning to homeschooling as a temporary solution to ensure they are being offered the resources and support through the district. Go beyond your obligations to Comar and district outreach to homeschoolers take very forms from in-school enrichment programs to part-time course enrollment to long distance academic support. Even some states allow homeschoolers to participate in extracurricular activities under the, um, the Tim, Tim Tebow laws, also known as the Equal Oppor Opportunity to Access and Education Act. Um, we need to do better for our school, our community, the classroom, virtual learning, and homeschooling. Thank you. Good, after, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jaquetta Taylor. I'm a resident of Hughesville for over 15 years. 
My husband and I are the parents of two sons and one daughter that attend La Plata High School. Our sons are special needs and are participating in honors classes and AP classes, and our daughter is in AP classes and participating in student government and much more. Our son struggled with in-person learning. However, they found success in virtual learning last year. Even our daughter found success and new drive to excel. Our children and other children within the school system need virtual options for many health reasons during the age of COVID. Based on Charles County Department of Health latest data from, from September the 8th, only 51% of children between the ages of 12 to 17 have been vaccinated. And the increase in cases within the county and school system shows the steady upward trend, which further endangers our children and our beloved teachers and family members. I have the following questions for the board and the superintendent to answer. Will you include all classes, tutoring, clubs, after school activities to benefit our children? Will you seek to expand, modify virtual learning academy to the full curriculum, including honors, AP classes, and career path programs? Will you move to require all classes to be recorded and available on Synergy as a standard practice? Excuse me. This is very emotional because my kids have been home and have not been back to school at all this year. So I am homeschooling them because they were already infected from going to the, um, the, the tour. So we've been home. So this is discerning because even just trying to get this stuff is hard. Let me get through this. Um, will you require all class assignments to be published on Synergy in advance? Will you restrict the use of paper in the classroom where age appropriate in order to slow the spread of COVID? Will you consider hazard pay for the teachers and other staff as a part of the retention plan that's needed in Charles County? Will you consider hiring a consultant to advise and implement the necessary technology in a classroom, such as auto tracking cameras, interactive whiteboards in the classroom, upgrading the electrical system to support the children's laptops and along with air purifiers for each classroom, which they can't have now. And I look forward to your response in a formal um, communication to all concerned parties, which is myself and every parent, every staff member that is affected. That's my time. Good evening, can you hear me? Okay, um, good evening. I would like to start off by stating that remaining I being critical of a school. I, I was like, just give me a minute. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was going to start again. Um, I would like to start off by stating that remaining critical of a school system's inability to efficiently and consistently implement processes necessary to ensure the health and safety and educational equity of our children is an action that should be executed without hesitation. CCPS has provided minimal parent engagement or involvement opportunities as it relates to schools reopening for the current school year. As a key stakeholder of our children throughout this school, this school district, parent involvement should have been a mandatory requirement during the back to school transition. As of today, September 14th, CCPS continues to provide unreliable and inconsistent transportation services to children throughout the district. Our school system has been plagued with issues ranging from children being dropped off in the wrong neighborhoods to children being completely forgotten and left on buses unsupervised. District-wide bus shortages and the inability to cover school routes remain key factors in the transportation difficulties we are still seeing three weeks into school. 
These factors, coupled with the fact that we are still in a pandemic, have caused much alarm for CCPS parents and transportation employees. One of your own CCPS bus drivers can be quoted stating, a lack, the lack of support is very frustrating. It's bad and it's only getting worse. As a parent, this terrifies me. Many questions come to mind, such as how can it get any worse? Not only do we have inconsistent and last minute communication in relation to bus routes and bus assignments, we are relying solely on bus drivers to transport our children, drop them off in the right location, not forget them on the bus and maintain COVID-19 safety protocols. According to the CCPS Student Code of Conduct, an essential element of the education process is the safe and efficient transportation of students as they travel between home and school. While this may be the established purpose of our transportation services, I ask, does CCPS truly feel they are upholding this promise to keeping all of our children safe and secure? I close with this, a recent account of a situation where a four-year-old was left on a school bus and almost forgotten. Imagine being a parent of a new pre-K student. Imagine calling the school to check up on your child for their first day. Imagine being told that your child, the child you placed on the school bus is not at school. Imagine being told that the school does not know where your child is. Now, imagine that the school discovers where your child is and begins to tell you that your child was left on the bus, the bus returned to the school lot, and that is where the bus driver found your child. As a parent, something happening to your child is the scariest thing in the world. So I request today, rather than assuming that you hold all of the answers when it comes to decisions that affect our children, include parents, hear parents, see parents, and please listen to parents. Thank you. It's Ajane Tavia. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, my name is Ajane Tavia, and I am currently a junior at Westlake High School. I am a 504 student who suffers from juvenile idiopathic rheumatoid arthritis. Unfortunately, I have the severest form in which I take heavy meds that kills my immune system. In addition, I live with my mother who is also immunocompromised. Returning into um, in-person learning is causing me a great deal of fear and anxiety. Charles County School System has not done enough to consider the needs of students who are immunocompromised. Currently at Westlake, some teachers and students are improperly wearing their masks and not socially um, distancing. Students are not being placed at a minimum of three feet apart and are not scanning their QR codes to complete their contact tracing. The additional safety precautions my doctor recommended in my 504 are also not being followed as we have yet to have a 504 meeting to discuss them. Um, I am aware that Charles County offered virtual learning. Unfortunately, it is being used as a form of punishment for not returning to in-person learning. So let me clarify my last statement. As a high achieving student with a GPA of a 4.1, I am forced to give up two of my honors classes and my AP course that provides me with college credits. In addition, I am restricted from participating in any extracurricular activities. As it stands, I am forced to choose between my health and my academic excellence. These classes are needed for me to fulfill my aspiration of becoming an anesthesiologist. As a student in a single parent household, I am in need of financial assistance to attend college. And this is why I work so hard during this pandemic to maintain good grades and to earn a place in these higher level classes. Part of me reaching my career goals requires me to have an impressive resume so that I can earn scholarships and a place in a prestigious college. I can't do any of this if I choose a virtual learning option. My mother is terminally ill and I cannot work and she cannot work. Therefore, she will not be able to afford college tuition for me. It's imperative that I perform well in school and to become involved in extracurricular activities because my college future depends on it. So I'm sure you can all understand the anxiety that I have every day when I walk through the doors of my high school. Imagine how my heart raced when I over overheard a group of students discussing that their senior prank should be replacing the QR codes that are used for contact tracing with other, another code that links a video on um, social media. Or how terrified I am to receive the email notice that yet another person that was in the building has COVID, especially when the kids are not scanning their QR codes daily as we are instructed to do. I'm constantly wondering if I was in contact with one of those people and if I'm going to get sick and bring it home to my mother. These are the thoughts that are constantly swimming in my head, which doesn't allow me to fully focus on my work. 
as I'm so horrified of um, contracting this virus that can potentially be fatal to me. I don't feel safe, and there is nothing that Charles County is doing to keep me safe. I've reached out to Dr. Navarro via email, and I've yet to receive a response from her. This shows how much Charles County cares. Thank you very much. Um, let me begin by thanking the board for opening up more online learning opportunities to the community. With that said, as a concerned parent, I'm asking the board to open online learning to students that are in advanced courses, that is other than on grade level, because COVID numbers are rising. It is my understanding that the current, currently the county is only offering online learning to on grade level students. Pulling data from recent Charles County Health Department dated September 8th, the Charles County level of transmission is high. As you know, this transmission rate indicates how much the virus, the virus is spreading and the amount of risk. In Charles County, both the positivity rate and case rate numbers are higher than the state of Maryland. The positivity rate, that is the number of positive tests for the county is 6.82, but the state of Maryland is 4.68, while the case rate that is a number of COVID cases per 1,000 residents is 25.38, and it is 16.97 for the state. Also pulling from the same data source, the total number of COVID cases per week by age group shows that for the under 18 age group from January to the week ending September 2nd, there was a, about a 50% increase in COVID cases. Now comparing that to the weeks ending August, 21st, uh, August 26th and September 7th, there was an increase of 34 cases or 31%. While this may not seem to be high, a high number to some, I will point out that data from the Charles County Health Department shows that a little over 50% of the population between 12 and 17 are vaccinated. As a parent, I interpret this to mean approximately half of the kids in my children's class are, are unvaccinated. Given this, it is inevitable that even with the best layering strategies, these numbers will continue to rise. Pulling also from the CDC website under a section titled New COVID-19 Variants and Prevention in Schools, I quote, some of these variants seem to spread more easily and quickly than other variants, which could lead to more cases of COVID-19. And I quote, as more information becomes available, prevention strategies and school guidance may need to be adjusted to new evidence on risk of transmission and effectiveness of prevention in variants that are circulating in the community. I say that given that we are in a high level of transmission status, I believe further adjustments are warranted. I realize that online learning is not for everyone, but for those of us who want this, I ask the board to make this option available and give us parents the choice to make the best decision for our children. Just as you adjusted policies on screening in open house, houses, I ask, you, I ask you do the same and open online learning to our advanced student population. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I'm looking forward to your response. Hi, good evening. Um, I will be brief. Um, my name is Leisha Dennis. I'm a parent of a middle schooler um, in Charles County. Um, I am requesting that Charles County Public Schools require COVID vaccinations or weekly COVID testing for their teachers and staff working with students. CCPS should move to do this for the following reasons. One, the President of the United States has now called on the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to create an emergency rule that require workplaces with more than 100 employees to require vaccination or weekly testing. President Biden's plan applies to private employees as well as public employees, including K-12 educators in the 26 states and two territories that have state-level OSHA-approved workplace safety plans, and Maryland is one of the Number two, several counties in Maryland have already moved to initiate the policy. Prince George's, Howard, Baltimore, Montgomery counties all require teachers to get the back or weekly COVID testing. Three, CCPS already requires all high school students participating in sports to either provide a fully vaccinated, proof of fully vaccinated um, COVID vaccination or to um, enroll in the free CCPS COVID-19 screening program. Athletes who don't provide this proof are unable to participate with the team at practices or at games. 
it is not unreasonable to expect at least the same standards for teachers and staff as we do for student athletes. Teachers and staff are working around our children with a large portion unable vaccination. I feel this is a more than reasonable ask of Charles County Public Schools as yet another layer of protection for our students from COVID and will provide a safer opportunity for schools to remain open. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shelly, stand up for, for, for a second. I'm, I want to kind of just be the, stand up. Congra <laughs> con congratulations on being designated Director of Communications for Charles County Public Schools. What, uh, what, what a pleasant, what a pleasant surprise and well-deserved. Congratulations. I hope I've, I've embarrassed you in a positive way. <laughs> Okay. And thank you for all that you, you do and all your hard work. Okay. Okay, uh, colleagues. We have uh, next on the agenda, we have a bunch of minutes that we need to approve. Um, please bear with me. I'm going to read the date of the... Um, the minutes and then hopefully we can progress through um, starting with May 24th uh, 2021 executive board meet uh, minutes I will entertain a motion yes so moved moved by mrs. McGraw second by, seconded by miss Brown all in favor Show of hand. Motions carries. June 10th, executive board mean, minutes. I will entertain a motion. I move to accept. Moved by Ms. Brown. Second. Second by Mr. Hancock. All in favor, favor raise your hand. Motion carries. June 15th, executive board minutes. I will entertain a motion. I move to accept. Ms. Brown moves. Second. Second by Mr. Hancock. All in favor? Motion carries. August 10th, board minutes. Motion to approve. Moved by Mr. Hancock. Second. Second by Ms. Brown. All in favor? Motion carries. August 16th, board retreat minutes. So moved. moved by Miss Abel. Second. Second by Miss Brown. All in favor, raise your hands. Motion carries. August 23rd, middle school redistricting virtual minutes. So moved. Second. Moved. second. Moved by Mr. Lucas. Second by Mr. Hancock. All in favor. Motion carries. Abstain. With one extension, Miss Abel. August 24th, middle school redistricting. I move minutes. to accept. Uh, mo moved by Ms. Brown. Second. Second by Mrs. McGraw. All in favor? Raise your hand. Seven in favor, one abstain. Ms. Abel. That was August 24th, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, September 7th, middle school redistricting virtual minutes. I move to accept. Moved by Ms. Brown. Second. Second by Mrs. Battle Lockhart. All in favor? Abel. Correction. Second by Miss Abel. All in favor? Motion carries. I will entertain a motion to accept personnel matters brought before us. So moved. Moved by Miss Abel. Second. Second by Mr. Hancock. All in favor? Motion carries. The FY. 2023 CIP state and local program. Move to accept. <laughs> Motion made by Mr. Lucas. Second. Second by Mrs. McGraw. Do I have a vote on this issue? Mm -hmm. Mr. Swartz. Mr. Swartz. The, the CIP and local program? Yes. Question. Uh, Okay, motion was uh, made by Mrs. McGraw, second by no, Lucas. No, I'm sorry. Motion made 
by Mr. Lucas, seconded by Mrs. McGraw. All in favor? <coughs> Motion carries. Reoccurring resolutions. Mr. Schwartz, what's the legal way of, d of doing this? Do I need to? It's all one. Huh? All it's one. all one. A good, okay. Separate, um, uh, we will not include the Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Munch that was um, approved earlier. We I can still leave that in here because it's recurring. Yeah. Okay. I will entertain a motion. I move to, to approve reoccurring resolutions. Second. Motion moved by Mr. Hancock, second by Mrs. Miss Brown. All in favor? Uh, seven uh, uh, vote yes. Miss Abel uh, abstains. Last motion for the night. So moved. Moved by Miss Abel. Second. Second by Mrs. McGraw. All in favor? Meeting adjourned. Okay. Thank you very much.